Bring extra lids with you because when you get to the show, if you open your jar before you hand it in to the, she- the secretary for the staging, you're going to want to make sure you open the jar and look on the inside of the lid and that there's absolutely no honey that got on the inside of the lid. So a clean lid is another thing that the judge is looking for. The inside rim of the glass also should be free of honey. So you're probably thinking now, how in the heck am I going to do that? How am I going to get this jar of honey that I've meticulously cleaned and polished? I've spent weeks filtering my honey, free of debris, free of bubbles. How am I going to get this to the show? Well, there are a couple things you can do. You can make a little case out of wood or cardboard that you can transport your honey in. And you can take the same kind of cotton that you use to filter your honey and cut extra pieces of it. Make sure it's completely free of lint and debris. And you can use that as padding to hold your jar secure in the container or box that you're going to bring it to the show in. Of course, you want to keep the box as level as possible so that the honey isn't moving about inside. So that's another tricky aspect of preparing your entries and getting them to the show. But what you want to bring with you to the show is a clean cloth, like we talked about before, uh, a little washcloth or something that you know has no cotton lint that's going to come off of it, and a little jar of water. And then you want to wash your hands well and wear a pair of gloves. You can use the rubber gloves, the kind that don't have powder on them. So like the nitrile gloves that we sometimes wear when we're beekeeping are good. Um, Any kind of little plastic glove that you can, uh, or rubber glove that you can wear that won't give any prints on your glass. And if you have a little bit of water, you can dip it in the water. You gently open your jar and take off your lid, inspect it for cleanliness, and you can uh, hold the jar carefully and spin this clean cloth with a little bit of water around the inside edge of your jar to clean off any possible honey that may have gotten there. You can use the same um, technique to clean the lid if you need to, or use your extra lids. If you see any bubbles or sediment or debris that may have settled on the surface of your honey, so you take the lid off and you take a flashlight and you look at the surface of your honey inside the jar, You do the same thing we're talking about with the cloth, but use a little spoon, like a little teaspoon. And you simply take the teaspoon and you dip it in a little bit of water and you go around the inside edge of the jar and just you're skimming off that top layer of honey. You've got your cloth nearby, you're wiping it off and you do it a few times until you're you're comfortable. And give yourself extra time to get these entries ready. So if the honey show rules are gonna give you the schedule and the rules are gonna give you the times that you need to arrive in the morning or the day before in order to get your entries um, submitted. If it says that the entries are accepted until noon, try to show up a, a good two hours earlier in case there's a little bit of a line. There's gonna be an area set up there for people to sit down carefully, quietly, and and prepare their entries so that they're comfortable with them before they're turned in. So if you have all these things with you, you'll have time to get everything just right before you hand it in um, for the show. So those are the other aspects of preparing the entry that I wanted to share with you. And the final one is using the same kind of cloth that's dry and taking your glass and giving it a good polish. So you're on a table surface and you're really gonna go around it everywhere that your fingers may have put a little smudge or a fingerprint or a a possible sticky spot. And this is the thing that you want the judge to see. Really shiny, really clean looking glass, clear honey. I mean, so clear that there's absolutely nothing, no flaws. And that is gonna give you such an edge to your your entry and possibly winning an award. Um, But take all the time you need before you get ready for that show to have everything just right. And if you have extra entries with you, again, if you find one is underfilled or overfilled, you can use your spoon to fix that error um, so you can change the fill level. I'll give you a hint that uh, a teeny bit overfilled is much better than underfilled. If the judge has to look at 100 entries and they start going down the line and they see a lot of underfilled entries, they're likely going to not go further with those entries, but they'll continue on with the ones that have the proper fill level. Um, So give yourself all the advantages that you can. Um, This is the most I feel like I can share with you right now about getting these entries ready. And I'd be happy to talk about questions before we take a break so that we 
we can address anything that you might be wondering about that I've mentioned. I'm sorry, I miss um, I missed that. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I um, was just I was just saying that um, I felt like we covered a lot of what we needed to for extracted honey. Yes. Um, I have a few questions. There's a few questions in, in the Q&A thread. Um, I could uh, let's start from the top. <laughs> let's start from the top. Okay, so Jennifer Douglas Block, she asks, can you share basic food safety practices? Um, I suggest you contact your, your, your regional body, um, such as your, your, your uh, Environmental Health Institute or your food or your food safety agency. One of the key things that I suggest all beekeepers in the Caribbean have is have their, uh, their food handler certificate. Um, you go to the doctors, there's a special, there's a basic form and you get, as a food practitioner, you should have a certificate to handle food. Um, David Small asked Jennifer if he can use this session as part of his profile. Okay, that's a side question. Um, Steven Slater, Jennifer, the honey show at Appamondia, Montreal was amazing. Did you enter? If so, how did you do? Thanks. So I wish I had an entry um, in Appamondia. I thought about it many, many times, but at the end, I really um, didn't. And, uh, and now I'm sad I didn't. I really should have, because um, once I saw how lenient they were with the preparation and the packaging, I felt more encouraged, but I had never attended Appamondia before, so I wasn't sure what to expect. The first um, place winner in extracted honey was in um, just a simple plastic bottle with cap. It wasn't filled properly. It had bubbles and sediment. And I left there feeling like a super person that could have easily you know, entered the competition and possibly won an award. Um, so now I'm more encouraged, but sometimes that's what needs to happen in order for us to have the experience to know what to expect. Um, I just want to show you two real quick. This is the plastic cap that I, I showed you in the picture, and this is the liner. So if I was getting ready for a show, I would just take something sharp and I would take that out before I even screwed it on top of the jar. Um, I didn't realize I had a cap close by, so I wanted to show you that. Um, and yeah, for food, food safety, um, you know, contact your local um, government regarding their requirements for handling food. We sanitize everything in our area. Um, we've got all the proper permits for food handling. We talked about how we keep the honeys here uh, below the legal moisture level. Um, and we monitor, uh, we keep, additionally, we keep records on each harvest. So each honey has a, a batch and lot. And when we extract it, we assign it that number and yes. date. And when we, when we put it in the bottle and send it to the stores, we actually make a notation in our logbook regarding that batch and lot in case there's ever an issue. We only would have to take out or recall the honeys from that particular batch and we would be able to go directly to that number and that batch. It would be a lot easier than having to sort through a whole year's worth of, exactly. of honey harvests and, and bottles that went out to different stores. So I hope that that's a helpful tip. Yeah, um, traceability is a very important thing. Um, uh, how do you sell bricks the, on the, with regards to the, um, the, the refractometer? What's the spelling of the bricks? The word uh, bricks. B -R -I -X. B -R -I -X, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we've got another question from Risha. What affects moisture in honey? Is moisture content affected by time of storage or packaging? It can be. It depends. Um, it depends on the moisture content at harvest time. Yes. Uh, again, we, like Richard was saying, you can check it in the field with your refractometer. Generally speaking, most species of bees won't cap honey, uh, you know, nectar that hasn't been ripened enough into honey. You know, they're reducing it from 70 or 80 percent down to that that number that we're looking for. But some species and in some circumstances, we find over time, if the honey hasn't been taken off the hive quickly or the hive is weak um, and the weather is very hot, we can see a fluctuation in that result. Um, so it's up to us to, you know, check that number. Uh, you could possibly dry the honey if you get it home and it's a little high. But again, taste it, make sure it's, it's tasty, palatable, 
um, because you don't want to offer your customer something that um, has an off flavor or is already starting to ferment. And I've actually definitely, especially with small hive beetle, have seen um, this issue in hives that were starting to weaken with full boxes of honey on top. And, you know, the beekeeper gets excited. Oh, I've got three or four supers I can take away at least. I'm losing this hive. But um, in the end, uh, because of the beetles, um, we have an issue with the honey either in yeast or um, some other fermentation from moisture. Yeah, yeah, you could, or you'll lose your reputation. Um, yeah. oh, Sh Siobhan Walker Ashby, good day. Kindly reconfirm the quality of honey required for the show. Um, it'd probably be an 18% moisture content, I believe, would be a good bet. Best bet, 18%, not yeah. 19, 18. Yeah. And honestly, if you could be lower than that, it's great because again, sometimes the judge might, he's, he or she is going to, you know, check the viscosity with um, a tasting rod by dipping it in the honey and then lifting it up and the honey is going to run off the, the rod and likely if it's thin, they're going to question the moisture content. So then you're at the will of a piece of equipment like the refractometer. Um, and again, um, if it's the calibration is slightly off, you could be you could be so close that they have one other entry that's as good as yours, but is 17%. Yes. And likely, likely that will win because of the fact that it's not so close to the edge. So you want to give yourself every advantage. So check off all the boxes um, and do your best in that regards. But if, if it's a region of the country or the world that in where you live, that the honeys are all typically high moisture, then I would recommend that the show committee and the organization be a little bit more lenient on moisture as long as the honey is flavorful and doesn't have any um, other issues um, that they might be a little bit more understanding about being close to the edge because that's that's more common we've had honeys entered in our shows from other places where we weren't um, lenient and we upset the entrant and then we had to have conversations with them after and make apologies and thank them for bringing that to our attention because, um, you know, again, it's up to the entrant to follow the rules for the show, but it's up to the organization to um, be understanding about what the criteria is. So if we know we have a lot of attendees coming from a, a part of the world that the honeys are high moisture, the show committee should consider that before um, posting the rules and be aware of that, that particular detail. Okay, that's good. And I think uh, Siobhan asked, ah, she was actually referring to um, quantity of bottles. I think it's three, three, three. four, three, three, yeah, three, four, um, three one. Pound. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, three one pound bottles is uh, very standard, so 16 ounces. Um, and again, I recommend making four, five, or even six of them so you have them in case there's an issue with one or two or three. Um, or possibly for another another class in the honey show, should you uh, make them and and the the show uh, has other classes, you might be able to enter with those other other jars. So yeah, and also if we, if we do the novice sec the novice category, it would just be one single bottle for the novice category. Correct. All right. uh, question from Risha. Uh, this question is for me, Richard Hunke, and the organizers. Some countries prohibit honey entering the country. TNT, Trinidad and Tobago is one of them. If entrants are bringing their bee honey products to the honey show, is a psychosanitary certificate sufficient? Um, we are working on that at this time. Um, at this point, we will be opening, we're not we're, we're taking guidance from our Ministry of Agriculture if they're going to give us permission to open all the categories, all the honey categories to um, to outside to the region. Uh, but for sure, persons who want to enter the photography and the arts can definitely do so. Persons that wish to open of enter the um, the, the wax and um, and uh, for, uh, um, beauty beauty product section, they could do that from the region. Uh, persons wanting to enter the mead section of competition could definitely do so from the region at this time. Uh, and I'm missing one. I'm missing. I think I'm missing one. Um, the honeys. We still have to work on the logistics of doing that um, with the Ministry of Agriculture. So it's, if it doesn't happen this year, definitely the following year we should have the logistics sorted out. Um, but definitely the other the categories that don't involve honey would definitely be able to 
allow persons to enter um, at this time, but we're still working on logistics. Probably by June, we'd, we'll be able to make a final decision if we'd be able to allow international and regional classes um, to enter, uh, honey, honeys to enter. Ah, oh, the cake, I just remember the cake. If you want to send us a honey cake all the way from Jamaica, I would love to taste it. <laughs> so the cakes, you should be able to, the cakes and um, the open class cackery, you should be able to enter for that um, extra from the region. So I hope that answers your question, Risha. Um, uh, Jennifer has another uh, question. It's good that you have effective traceability system. Everybody should have this traceability system. Um, you should, if you're selling your honey in any of the, one of the islands, it should have a batch, a section on the back of your label that should have a batch batch code for you to enter your batch number, your batch information. All of us should be doing that. If we're not doing that, we're doing something wrong. All right, so you should start make that provision uh, for yourself. It's not if it's not enforced in your country or your region. Do the self do the self um, regulatory thing and get yourself to the, the international standards so that at least you can stand above the rest when you go to marketplace with your products. Um, but, uh, uh, so that was, okay, we've answered Sivan already, the quantity issue. Hugh Smith um, joined late. Can you guide me to the website with all this information? Um, tomorrow we will have um, your colleague tomorrow, um, Jennifer. Carla. Carla. Carla yeah. will be one and she's got uh, her, her, her website is um, Appy, Appy <laughs> Solutions Consortium. Um, and they have a lot of information as to judging and competitions and so forth there. So Carla will be on tomorrow morning at 10. She kicks off the show tomorrow um, and she's going to have a great a, 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 a wealth of information, wealth of knowledge, wealth of expect, experience, um, Hugh. So um, Carla will be the girl for that one, but we can definitely hook up the, um, the website. I'll put, I'll put a link to the website in, in the chat for you. Um, okay, so we've done that one. Uh, Jennifer Douglas again. Is the product label a requirement for the show? No, no labels on the, no labels on the bottles. I, I should let that Jennifer answer that one. Sorry. Okay, so this is a great question. So you can have a class for labels if you'd like. We usually call it a commercial class here, um, but you could you know call it whatever you like. Um, but it would showcase the company's labels and sometimes that um, art and or um, you know design is taken into consideration for the class as well as all the other criteria we discussed but I'm glad you asked it because in the slides that we showed you saw some small white labels on the bottom of the jars right so those are the entry labels that you'll be given when you enter your honey or any class any um, entry that you bring to the show the show staff are going to have some of those white labels so that they can assign you uh, a number and um, a way for them to record your entries in a book so that when the judges are judging each entry, they have absolutely no idea, hey, this is Richard Sonny because his name is on the jar, you know, so we have to have this, um, this discretion and on anonymity or um, we can't do a good job. If I um, am a judge of a honey show and I see art that I'm, uh, I, I know the artist or I know the photography, I excuse myself, even if it's a cake or a candle that I just know it came from this particular person. You would be surprised how many times you'll judge a, a particular show year after year. And you might even pick up a fragrance from somebody's beeswax um, and say, I am pretty certain I know who entered this and I don't feel comfortable judging it because um, it's an unfair uh, thing for me to do that. So um, just to answer the label question, there will be some labels that you'll have to place on your jars. Um, I did it. I did it. Oh, Richard's not muted. I'll keep talking. So those labels go a half inch up from the bottom of the jar and centered as best as possible. And this is something the judge is gonna look at. So if you can keep them straight, you can use a small piece of wood or a ruler to measure the height and get the levelness correct on those jar labels. Um, but this is gonna be something that you're gonna do as the entrant when you're getting your entries ready. They're gonna hand you, you're gonna fill out a form, an entry form, 
hand it in, and then they're going to hand you back some labels, and you're going to go to the staging area and sit with your cloth and your gloves and your jar of water. You've got some earbuds in your ears. Um, um, yeah, sorry, um, Jennifer, one other question. We've got um, uh, David Small. Uh, he wants to become a honey judge. Great. So, um, I guess he has to come to Florida. Yeah, um, at this time, everything is virtual um, for the Spring Bee College in March, and we didn't add the honey judge uh, training to the March schedule. But David, don't um, don't despair. We'll take care of you. I'll contact Amy after today and let her know that you're interested. And I'll personally try to work on something that we can do with you from afar to get you prepared. And hopefully in the fall, we'll have something in person for anyone to attend if it's safe. Okay, great. So I think we've answered all of the questions in that, um, in that section. So I don't know if we want to take a break or we're going to move on or what we're going to do. I think a short break, um, if anybody needs to, just grab a quick drink, um, use the restroom, maybe, what, 10 minutes? Yeah, sure. So let's take a quick 10-minute break, folks, and um, we'll resume in, uh, uh, let's say, um, oh, it's 11.28 now, so let's, let's resume at um, 11.40. Great. Yeah. Sounds so good. Good everybody. So we're going to take a quick break, guys, and we'll queue back up at 11.40. Thanks a lot. Okay. Be right back. Right. So back in.
Unleash and unleash Community spirit Unleash The People's Knowledge Fair at the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. 
The People's Knowledge Fair at the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair at the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national all the good ways to go. Yeah, pretty much We're just at the tip of the iceberg Okay, um, so what do we do next? What do we do next? Um, well, okay, um, one thing I just want to mention to everybody um, that I'm going to try to, I try to, if you want to make a, um, uh, to speak or make a, to ask a question, you can just go to, um, you can just, I'm going to try and unmute you so that you can speak into speak. So once I, I give you access to speak, all you have to do is unmute your microphone and speak and you should be as good as gold. You should be able to communicate directly um, with Jennifer. So um, hopefully we're going to try that. Um, so let's try and make it as interactive as possible. Um, I know I like hearing my own voice, but I don't like hearing my own voice that much. Um, I see Lorraine. Archibald has a, a hand up. I'm going to press the allow to talk button, Lorraine. So all you have to do now is unmute your mic and we should be able to hear you. Unmute your mic, Lorraine. Unmute your mic. No, Lorraine doesn't want to unmute her mic. All right. Okay. Um, I think Mr. Romulus may have better success. So let me try to get by Mr. Giles Romulus, our great patron from Jeff SGP. Mr. Romulus, can you go ahead and unmute your microphone and speak? Can we hear you, sir? Hey, Richard, how are you? Ah, wonderful, it works. I wasn't a crazy guy after all. It does work. Right. I want to compliment both of you. Uh, wonderful presentations this morning, Jennifer. Really interesting. I'm not a, a B person as such, but I understand B more uh, in terms of the ecology and what it does to the environment. I come. I approach this from a geographer's perspective and environmental planner. So for me, B species are very, very important uh, for the conservation of the biodiversity and so on. And I'm really, I really want to say thanks on behalf of my organization for your contribution to this event. I think we are contributing to the knowledge. We are reducing the knowledge deficit here in, in the Caribbean uh, in this uh, important agriculture. And uh, you are contributing to helping us to grow a new industry in a way that, uh, uh, in an unprecedented manner. So thank you very much. Well done, Richard, as usual. I'll be monitoring and listening and learning at the same time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Persons, Thank you. Just one more point, uh, Richard. All the persons on, I really would like them to be interactive, ask questions. Let's be as children. Let's ask questions so that we can make this interactive and uh, so we can, you know, get the maximum for it. Thank you very much. Keep up the great work. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, once again, so that's great contribution there from Mr. Romulus. Um, yes, there is going to be a recording, Frida Ferguson, and I will post the link to you shortly. Rich, uh, what training in the region? What training in, in what what training in the region is there to become a beekeeper? I think from the last international seminar, such was mentioned. Um, okay, I'm going to digress a little bit. Please forgive me, Jennifer. Um, from a regional perspective, uh, we do have. Um, our regional apiculture project that will be starting very, very soon. 
Um, Trinidad is a participating country in this regional project. Trinidad, um, St. Kitts, uh, Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenada, and as I said before, Trinidad and um, Samoa in the South Pacific, one of the South Pacific islands. So seven, seven countries in this project. Um, I would suggest you get in contact um, with the Jeff SGP um, office in Trinidad and Tobago, um, Dr. Sharda Mahabir, and she'll be able to give you some more information as to what group she'll be working with in the beekeeping community in Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago. And there'll be a lot of tr online training. Um, we're doing a lot of on online programs. Um, hopefully we'll be doing some collaboration with the, with the University of the West Indies. We'll definitely be doing collaboration with the University of the West Indies um, and, the and the Open Campus, Arthur Lewis in St. Lucia. And hopefully I've spoken to um, the folks up at the University of Florida and you know maybe there may be some collaboration at that level as well. So let's give it some time and let's see how how, how we progress in that regards. But there is going to be a lot of information available for training within the Caribbean region in the coming. At least there's going to be a jam packed with training, and there'll be a lot of inter online packages that you could interact with um you know to, if you want to get your basic beekeeping level sorted out now you can do that through some of the programs that we have we have running and if you want to get more advanced you can go to places like um university of florida um cornell university in new york they have fantastic online master beekeeping programs which are available for persons to participate in as well as what we are producing out of the caribbean um, which you will be able to learn more about in the weeks and months coming. Hope that answers your question, um, Risha. Um, thank you. I'm having connection issues, but I don't want to miss. Shadal, Harry, I am very new to this. Just want to learn about honey, so I'm interested in learning. Okay, that's great. That's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so we want to kick things off again. Um, um, you ready to go? Ready to rock and roll? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> okay, so bring up the next slide. That would be wonderful. Okay, so let's go back into oops, share screen mode. Let's kick the next slide across. And let's go into share screen mode. All right, there you go, all yours, Jennifer. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you for the kind um, compliments, um, Dr. Romulus, and the organizations that are involved in this education. Um, I have to commend you for everything that you do um, as a beekeeper and um, just as a, a person, the sustainability of everything we're doing and everybody, the, the value I place on life um, here and everywhere is great and um, sharing this much information is a pleasure for me to do. Um, I hope it is uh, positively impacting um, your lives and I hope to stay in touch with all of you and, and meet you and learn from you as well. Um, but thank you for everything that you all do. Um, so just to continue on, I know the extracted honey class is a big one and that we put a lot of emphasis on um, preparing the entries, but it's not um, for naught. It's a very uh, important class and honey shows all over the world. But I mentioned a few times to you, I, I forgot I had this slide in here and I'm really happy to see it. It makes me smile. I hope it makes you smile. But this is the novice class. This is a show that I was able to participate in in um, the US and California. Um, the show is called um, the Heirloom Expo. It's put on by an organization called Baker Creek Seeds. And um, the seed company itself is well known for uh, maintaining lines of um, heirloom foods that have been grown in our country and around the world for the history of, of humankind, where I think Richard and I have had a, a couple of great conversations developing some yes. of this programming regarding how important I think it is that we stay in touch with recipes and foods from our region, our culture, our families, um, sometimes it's lost. They say on the youth, our, our next generations aren't as um, interested in those foods. But here in Florida, we're learning to forage and find things that are easy, that grow well, that 
not only sustain us, but our bees and, and wildlife. And um, this show in particular is literally just table. You can see some of it behind me, table upon table upon table of a giant room full of uh, heirloom fruits and vegetables that you won't see in the supermarkets, but they've been um, important to someone at some point in time in the documentation of them each of those squashes behind us have a placard with a name and um, many of them are entered into competitions. So there's a, a competition regarding the food, but uh, because they're such wonderful people and they have an interest in everything, they also invited us to come and have a honey competition. Um, so what you're seeing there are some um, different uh, entries that won awards, a couple of really nice people that I got to judge the honey with. And um, you'll notice that there are ribbons there. So that's the exciting and aspect of uh, entering all of these uh, competitions is having the possibility of winning an award. This show was very lenient as far as the um, rules and regulations and strictness and entries. And it was done because the people entering are not familiar with the stuff that you and I are sharing with each other right now. And we wanted them to feel encouraged, positive and walk away with a good feeling and also uh, award people some, um, some prizes. So um, there's different packaging there. So we weren't strict about the jars, the lids, the fill level, all the things we discussed earlier about ex extracted honey. And that's how I would recommend handling the novice class. Um, so I wanted to include that slide and share a little bit about that experience that I had. And I hope you get excited about honey shows and find your way to other places in the world to visit and participate in honey shows outside of your area as, the, as you get going in this. Um, Richard, uh, would I... Quick question. What's the name of the seed? I see somebody asked, what's the name of the seed company? Baker Creek Seeds. B-A-K-E-R. Okay. Tremendous company. Unbelievable people. And then when it's easy um, for you, Richard, I'd love to see the next slide. Of uh, course, of course, of course. I'm sorry. A thousand apologies. Oh, not at all. Take your time. No, 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 no. Um... Yeah, there you go. It's moved across there. So there our go. next category is the um, comb honey. And we have two classes in the show, usually um, chunk or uh, chunk comb in the jar. With, so that would be a chunk of honeycomb in the jar with honey and section. Um, but look at that frame. Some of the honey shows also have a class where you enter an entire extracted, um, a non-extracted, non -extracted, sorry, frame of um natural comb that the bees drew out. So what you would produce for honeycomb. And um, that is a class in and of itself. It's really, really hard to do. I don't know how um, comb honey production is for you where you live, but here in the US and the region that I live, it's more and more difficult for us to have the bees have enough resources to draw out um, excess wax and a place to store honey. And even the midsection of this frame would be all natural wax. And so um, again, that's a lot of resources. So comb, comb honey is coveted and revered here now, and it's very um, minimally produced, um, except for some regions where there's crops that are produced in mass, like clover and alfalfa, which aren't necessarily my favorite crops because they're largely monocrops at this point in time. Um, but, you know, small, small scale comb honey production has definitely um, become a, a more of a, a rarity here in the United States, but it's so important. And you can see this frame has got some plastic on it. I found this on Etsy. Um, so I can tell that um, you could easily be producing something like this and, and get the, the best dollar value of dollar for uh you know the what you're producing because it's really coveted people customers i don't know if you're selling honey already you'll probably know that your customers are always asking you for comb honey um so we we try to make sure we have a little bit but it does sell out before we're able to produce more the frame that you see is an example of a good frame of comb honey but i want you to take note of the open cells on the right side of the frame because in preparing an entry for the comb honey, whether it be the section or the chunk in the jar, um, I'm going to make sure and tell you that you want to avoid having any open cells at all. You want to find a frame more like the one above it standing up behind it that has very few empty cells along the right side edge. Um, that one looks almost good enough. You can't see the whole entire frame, but I could tell you that if I saw that in a competition, I would give it a good look over and I'd be happy to judge it, but I might avoid or not even judge the one below it. 
um, unless it was a really lenient show and I was um, wanting to give good feedback to the entrant and um, make them feel encouraged. Um, but, you know, for a stricter show, those um, open cells would be uh, something that might disqualify your entry. So that's the first thing I want to tell you is if you're going to go through the trouble of preparing um, the comb honey for show, you want to make again extra. So you're going to do the best you can to make as many frames as possible because you're going to pick your, pick your best sections and your best chunks. Um, and when you prepare this after you take it off of the bees, and one tip I'll give you is to ver use very little smoke um, when you remove these frames, because you don't want any of that smoke um, to become part of the aroma or flavor in this or even your extracted honey. So be mindful when you're extracting honey, if you can, um, to use very little smoke um, to avoid getting any kind of soot or uh, smoke smell in the comb or in the honey um, that's detectable by the judge. Um, and then when you remove this again, you want to keep it under a fan, keep it dry and prepare it as soon as possible. Um, and in preparing this, there's quite a bit of effort to be made. So for a section, there's usually a container listed in the rules and most of the containers are pretty simple. They're rectangular in shape. They're usually plastic. Um, they have a lid and it's up to the show if they would like to do something different, but that's typical. Um, just a small, what we call like a clamshell container um, usually holds about 10 to 12 ounce piece of comb with honey. Um, and in order for you to prepare it, you simply need to find a rack like you would to, to put cookies on to cool, something like a wire rack. And you wanna put this entire frame gently down on that and use a serrated knife and cut along the outside edge of each top bar, bottom bar and side bars until you can remove the entire frame of comb out onto that wire rack. And then you're gonna need to make a template that fits the section inside your container because what you really are looking for here is for your section of honeycomb to fit the container almost entirely. So you want it to be very snug. You don't want it to have a lot of excess room around the outside. So the comb should really take up the entire space of the container. And you can make a template out of a simple piece of cardboard or paper. A stiff piece of paper is much better than a, a thin piece of paper. So you can take it and I don't know if you've ever cut, cut a piece of parchment paper to fit inside a cake pan, but it's not much different than that. You can um, rub the paper on the outside of the container to get an imprint take a scissor and cut it until you get it to be the size that you feel is a good template for that container. Um, and then you lay that on top of the honeycomb and you use a sharp knife, uh, usually a serrated knife, um, not quite a giant bread or cheese knife, but something a little smaller like a steak knife. Um, you can warm the blade gently, but don't get it too hot because if you do, when you go to cut your comb, you may melt the wax and the judge will see that line of melted wax where the cut was made and that could easily disqualify you. So there's kind of a fine line between, between warming the knife blade and making the knife blade too hot. You can um, actually practice without warming the blade at all and see if the cut looks nice and um, crisp. What you're looking for is a really crisp cut line on the comb. And then again, um, you see the surface of this frame where all of the cells are already capped nicely. But I want you to look at the surface and note that some of it is uh, white and uh, looks dry. And then you'll notice one or two of the cells where the capping sunk and is actually sitting on top of the level of honey. Um, so you see a little bit of a moisture coming through the, you know, visibly for that cell. Um, believe it or not, some honey shows are so particular in judging that if they see that one cell, it could be the difference between a first place for that particular section and the one right next to it that doesn't have any of those sunken cappings that sit on top of honey. Now, I know that's a lot to ask of you, but I'm just giving you all the information that you might need for a really strict show and then encouraging the organization to be little bit more understanding and lenient as people are uh, learning and that they would be more accepting of some of that. You know, we have bees uh, of all different kinds all over the world. Some of them, that's the way they store honey. Some store with a little air gap between the level of honey and the capping and some don't. And depending on the actual nectar flow and season, 
um, and things that the bees are working with, this uh, result can change drastically from one frame to the next. So it puts a very great level of difficulty on preparing this entry for a honey show. All of these different things that you have to be aware of and um, particular about in preparing it. The good news is people want honeycomb so much that even the things you're practicing on that don't quite make it, you could easily put in a clamshell and sell to your consumer and they're going to be thrilled to be able to purchase it. Um, and if you work hard at it, you'll probably find a piece that's suitable for the judge to look at. And if not, don't be deterred. Try again the next season that you have a good nectar flow. So you, you've got the frame and you're looking at it carefully and trying to find the best absolute section. Maybe practice cutting with your template a different area of the frame first so you get a, a familiarization with how the knife is gonna cut through the wax and take a little care um, to do that so that when you're ready to cut that perfect piece, you don't have an accident cutting it because you hadn't practiced yet. That's another tip that I like to share. So you're, you're gonna make one or two pieces first just for practice. And again, your customers are gonna be thrilled to purchase them. And then when you're good and ready, take a deep breath and cut the piece that you want for your section container for your show and place it on the wire rack and let it drain at least for a day. You wanna keep this in an area that's not likely to absorb anything from the air in the way of moisture, dust, dirt, or debris, because believe you me, if there is a, a piece of hair or a piece of dust or a piece of lint or something that could possibly find its way to that honey um, comb, it's going to find its way. So try to find a nice area that you can put this where it's dry and cool um, cool enough to keep and dry enough to keep your honey from absorbing moisture in the air and um, getting any extra moisture added because even though it's capped as we know as beekeepers um, there is a certain level of permeability to the the cappings um, so it could absorb moisture um, plus our eyes are unless you're using a really fine scope you may there may be a puncture here or there that you're not aware of so do take great care once you cut the section and place it someplace to rest let all the liquid honey from the areas where you open the um, comb um, drain completely. So when you go to place this section in your container, no honey will come out of that section and drip into the plastic. So when you, when you place the entry in the show, your judge is gonna pick it up and it's not gonna have any puddle of honey underneath the section. It'll be nice and dry inside the box. So that is pretty much um, the main objective of preparing the section for, uh, for a honey show. And I'm going to move right into preparing the chunk comb in a jar. And then we can take a minute or two for um, questions because I know there's going to be some. So to prepare the chunk comb for the jar, in the rules, there's going to be a container or jar required. And the jar usually has a wide mouth opening and is straight sided. So it's not like our, um, some of our honey jars where you saw earlier that the neck was much smaller than the sides of the jar. We're talking about a, jar, a jelly jar or a mayo jar or a salsa jar or something that's a straight sided jar. And um, the section that you're gonna put in there, the chunk needs to be exactly the width of the center of the jar. And I can show you that after, after I talk about it for a minute. So I'll talk for a minute and then I'll ask Richard kindly to um, give me the video, but let me just sure. talk for just a couple minutes more about it. So again, you take a piece of cardboard or thick paper and you, the circle of the top of your jar has a middle and the middle is the width of the jar. That's the measurement you're going to want to make with your um, with your template. And then the second measurement is the height of the jar. So you're going to want to measure from the bottom inside of your jar all the way up to that ridge that I showed you on the honey jar that I filled earlier. That's the fill level for your honey, but it's also the height of your section of uh, comb that you're going to cut for this jar. You want that piece of comb to take up at least 50% of the jar. That's one of the requirements for most of the honey shows that your chunk of honeycomb takes up at least 50%. So the entire width of the jar, the entire height of the jar up to the fill line. By now you're probably thinking that that piece of comb is gonna float around in the honey once you fill it. Well, it could, but based on the size that you're using, um, it won't get squished by the lid when you, when you close it. And the, here's the other tip. You're gonna prepare this chunk the same way you did the section. You're gonna 
cut a few first for practice on the frame where you see something that isn't as pretty as the piece that you want to cut for the jar. And you're going to finally get to the point where you're ready to cut the one for the jar. And you're going to, you're going to cut it and you're going to let it drain on the wire rack for a day till no more honey is dripping out, just like you did for the section. And then when you're ready, you're going to pick it up carefully and place it inside the jar. Now it's a snug fit because you've used the entire width of the center of the jar, the diameter um, from left to right of the circle. Um, and so you're going to likely, uh, it's like playing the game of uh, operation. If you've ever played the board game operation, you have to use a little tweezer and try to reach in this teeny little circle hole to pick up something. And if you touch the outside edge, you're going you're gonna to hear a loud buzzer go off. Well, you're going to be as careful as possible to place this piece of comb into the jar without touching the sides. If you touch the sides, you're likely going to get some wax and honey on the inside that the honey is not so hard to clean off, but the wax, whoo, that's not so easy to clean off. So it's a careful and delicate balance between having the section uh, cut just precisely to fit, not too big where it really touches the sides when you place it in, and not too small that it, there's a lot of room in between the sides of the jar. So this is going to take a good deal of practice, and I'm going to wager that you might make several of them before you get it just right. And that's okay. Do you, do you want me to switch the video now? Sure. So here we have the type of jar that I was describing to you. It's a straight sided jar. In the US, this is a 16 ounce jar. Um, it actually um, is a 12 ounce jar by weight, but it's it holds 16 ounces of honey um, by weight. So by volume, this is a 12 ounce jar for canning purposes, but as you know, honey doesn't weigh the same. So we always have to have um, a little bit of math skills and figuring out what our jars need to be. <laughs> so, and it does have a very wide mouth opening. So this is by no means um, a perfect example of what you would do for a honey show, but it, it is a good example that we can handle and show each other um, some of the things that you might do. Um, after this is carefully measured and you want to place it in the jar, uh, again, it's going to just barely fit. So you're going to have to be very, very careful as you're, as you're placing it down on the inside of the jar. And if you go to place it and it's just too snug, don't push it, take it out and give it another trim, just a hairline trim on the side, um, if you can carefully, just to make it go in easier so you can avoid having that um, difficulty of having it touch the sides of the jar. I talked a little bit about what you're gonna pick as far as the surface and the, the way that the cappings look. But there's another thing that I didn't get a chance to talk about yet with both the um, section and the chunk, and that's the midline. So I don't know how well you can see this, but I think it's pretty visible that the midline of this is just really off. The cells on one side are completely um, longer in length than the ones on the other side. And the judge would be so thrilled if you picked the piece of comb that had the midline in the center and the cells were equidistant on the right and the left. That's gonna give you a much better score, both in your section and your chunk comb. So when I said this was difficult, I wasn't kidding. This is a really, really difficult one to do. Um, we talked about 50% or more of the comb going into the jar, and then we talked about how it might float a little bit. To prevent it from floating, there's two things you can do. You can place the jar on a pan briefly, and bring the pan onto a stove and turn the heat on. And what you're gonna do is just heat the jar up very slightly. So I'm talking a very low amount of heat. And the bottom of the jar should be warm, but not hot. It's just like we spoke about earlier with using the sharp knife to cut the comb. You want the knife blade to be warm enough to help you make the cut, but not so hot that the wax starts to melt when it touches. So when you go to place this piece of comb in the jar and it's warm, it's gonna to adhere to the bottom of the jar, but not melt and stick there by, by way of liquid wax. So it's just warm enough to touch and hold, but not warm enough to melt. From there, you have another important task. You need to fill the jar properly, like we did with the extracted honey earlier, and you need to use the same honey that's in the section comb and in the chunk comb. So you want a matching honey, always. So it's important that you use the same exact honey that you have in this comb, and it could be from a crushing strain or an extracted frame, but just be careful to make sure you use the same, because if the judge notices a different color uh, between the two honeys or moist, moisture content or anything, 
he may take out your chunk and uh, perforate a cell with his taste, his or her tasting rod and taste the honey and check the moisture. Um, so you don't want to raise any flags. You want to make the honey match in all respects. Um, excuse me for one, one brief second. Okay, so now that um, same thing applies to the chunk comb in a jar with the lids, whatever lid that you use, please make sure it's clean and doesn't have a scratch and doesn't have a safety seal on it and fill the jar to the same level that you filled your extracted honey to. And also you wanna prepare the honey in the same exact way. You don't wanna see any debris in your chunk or section comb. So you wanna hold the flashlight up to it before you um, decide which piece you're gonna use and enter. And you wanna look for any uh, soot or debris from the hive or anything that's dark in color. You wanna see clean wax, clean honey, um, there may be an occasional bubble that's understandable, but after you fill this jar, leave the lid slightly um, uh, loose so that those bubbles can raise to the surface and then adjust your fill level properly before closing the lid tightly to bring it to the show. Prepare it exactly as you did the other jars, shine it, polish it, pick your best glass, pick your best lids um, and pick your best containers. Um, all of those things are going to help you make sure that your entry is uh, the best one on the show bench. Um, I'd love to take a minute or two for questions on this because I know that's a lot of information. Okay, um, I'm going to try to um, unmute person's mics so they can we can get to hear their voices and they can ask their question themselves. So, Risha Allen, I'm going to. You can unmute your mic and you can ask your question directly. So go ahead. Hi, morning all, or good afternoon. Um, I was wondering what you meant by floating. Is it really just a matter of not moving, having the comb stand upright in the jar? Yes, absolutely. So when the comb is inserted in the jar, and then you add honey, if the comb doesn't take up the majority of the jar or it's not um, sort of sitting down on the bottom, like I mentioned, when you warm the jar, there is a possibility that might, it might float um, off the bottom of the jar. So when the judge opens it, part of the comb would be sticking out above the surface of the honey where you filled it to. And you don't want that for a honey show. You would like to see the comb um, sitting below the level, just below the level of the honey that you filled it to and not floating. So when the judge looks at the jar, um, they will see that that comb is seated all the way at the bottom of the jar. So there isn't a, like a half inch or an inch of honey before the comb starts. They wanna see it all the way from the top to the bottom. Okay, so does that answer your question, Risha? Yes, I just had a, um, another quick question, if possible. Um, sure, go ahead, go ahead. When, um, Jennifer, you were talking about the equidistance of the comb, um, I mean, how is that possible? Um, the, the example you showed, one side was equidistant to each other, but they were larger than the ones on the other side. It's a very difficult task. I mean, the biggest aspect of our contribution is to seat, um, say, a 100% thin foundation in the middle of a wooden frame. And that's the best we can give to the bees to give them an opportunity to um, work from the center outwards. But at the end of the day, the bees um, will definitely um, do different things. So then the beekeeper, when they go in, the hive, they have to sort through these frames and try to find the ones where the bees were fairly um, regular as far as the depth of each cell on both sides. One thing you have a little bit control of other than the thin uh, foundation or letting the bees use natural is uh, the spacing of the frames. Some beekeepers that use uh, wooden boxes that hold a certain number of frames in the case of like a Langstroth frame, and it really doesn't matter. It's just an example. It could be a, a, a piece of wood or whatever you're using. Um, it doesn't matter. But the, the size of the box or the cavity where the frames go and the normal spacing that a beekeeper would use for bee space, sometimes a beekeeper producing this type of comb will put one less frame in the box and put a little extra space in between each frame 
um, in order for the bees to draw that cell a little larger on both sides of the midsection. Um, and that will extend it all the way to the edge of the top bar um, and make a nice full frame for um, like the frame I showed you in the slide. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily always apply, but it is a technique that you can practice with and, and see if it helps. Um, there's a lot more to it, of course, the, the, the box of frames going on the bees when the nectar flow has already started and is in full effect, at least 10% or more seems to be helpful. I've had other beekeepers um, tell me to make sure that there's um, adequate nurse bees and young bees and uh, the population is extremely high and even to restrict the queen um, way down away from the honey super and um, not having her um, lay eggs for a few days or a week or longer. There are so, so many techniques to doing this type of comb honey that um, even myself, I haven't had a chance to, to try, but I'm always interested in learning more about it. Um, but I hope some of that's helpful. Okay, so um, we can push on. I don't, oh, Stephen Slater. Uh, we're prepared. Okay, Stephen, I'm going to unmute you so you can um, uh, ask your question yourself, sir. Let's use the technology. So you're unmuted, Stephen. Just go ahead. Hi, Jennifer. Stephanie. Sorry, Stephanie. Sorry. <laughs> That's Stephanie. okay. That's okay. Apologies. <laughs> Stephen was my dad. That's okay, Richard. All right. Okay. Hey, Jennifer, um, my county uh, honey show has just added a full frame of honey class. Um, and so this year, uh, would be the first year I would enter. Uh, my question is, for the full frame, um, should thin surplus be used or is it acceptable to have wired wax foundation for the full frame class? That's a really great question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, it really depends on the show and typically the wired foundation is not acceptable. Um, Usually the, the judge would like to see a full frame um, without wiring. Um, so the thin surplus would be the best way to go for that. Yes. Great, thank you very much. Of course, yes. good luck. Yes, yes. Let us know, please. <laughs> thank you. All right, so I think we, uh, we don't have any more questions for now, so we can push ahead and with our presentation. So awesome. should we go back to our share screen. That'd be wonderful. Uh, we're gonna talk about wax next. Yep, uh, if the slide will move. Okay, beeswax, there you go. So just a quick um, bit about beeswax and then I'll show you a few things that I have here for you. Um, some of the classes in honey shows for beeswax are beeswax blocks and candles and also beauty products, which I think all three classes are being considered for this show that's developing for December. Um, the beeswax block, um, if you could go to the next slide for me, Richard, please. This is a really beautiful photo. Um, our friend in Northern Ireland um, has a show for the INIB and um, is also one of the judges that brought the, the type of judging we're discussing uh, to, the, to America and to the University of Florida. And I, I don't know if you can see the detail um, that has gone into these entries, but it really um, takes me back a little to think about how much time and effort has been um, given to just taking some beeswax that we produce from our bees and make it into a cake that is basically flawless um, in, in its shape, uniformity, um, color. And if you shine a, a flashlight through that cake of wax, you'll see nothing um, but the same uh, texture throughout, no streaking, no bubbles, no sediment. Um, the color of wax in the UK and in Europe for this particular class is usually like a creamy um, canary uh, yellow color. But in the U.S. and maybe where you are, um, you might have some other types of waxes um, developed from your bees. We have, tend to have some darker waxes here, some real uh, gold and yellow and orange waxes. Um, the, the aroma can vary greatly. Some of the waxes that I've smelled from um, Europe and other parts of where I live in the U.S. have a lot of 
I say propolis. I don't know if you say propolis, but I'm just going to say it my way and we can chuckle about it together. Um, but some of these waxes have the, the most amazing scent of um, propolis. But where I live, we don't really have um, the type of trees um, that the bees collect a lot of sap and produce propolis here. Um, and also the, the types of bees genetically that we um, have are typically not heavy propolis collectors. Um, so, but I, I do enjoy smelling wax that has that. And I know I'd love to hear from you about your wax someday. Um, making a cake of wax, again, you follow the rules that are set forth for the show. Usually there's a specified weight um, to how much wax is gonna be in your cake and it's not an exact weight. So the good news is you have a range. So that gives you a little bit of um, forgiveness in whether or not it's exact or not. It might say, one between one and a half and two pounds. So you'll take a, a nice little scale and measure your wax before you prepare it. And we can go into preparing wax just a little bit, but I'm not going to go in too great um, of detail because I think most of you probably have done this before, but if you haven't, we can um, discuss it. But basically the cappings wax, again, just like we shared earlier for your honey, for your extracted classes, you can re then reserve the same cappings that you used um, and I don't use a water method for melting my cappings. I use a double boiler. So I take one larger pot that I don't care about because it's going to get completely full of um, wax and never be used again for cooking. So you might want to find just like an inexpensive pot that you don't care too much about. And then another pot that fits inside it, um, not too tightly because you're going to put some water in the bigger pot and then you're going to nest the second pot inside. And that's where you're going to put your cappings. And you want to use a, a good amount of heat to get the water hot, but then you want to turn it down when it starts to come to a simmer or a boil because wax is flammable at a certain temperature around 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I've never had a um, concern or a fire, but I always like to exercise a little caution and teach with a little bit of caution and share with a little caution. So please be mindful of having um, a double boiler set up and on the stove or on the fire. Um, that you don't uh, step away from it for too long and keep a real good watch on it because it could become an issue if you're not tending it carefully. Um, so it is flammable. Um, so you get the double boiler going and you have your cappings in there and um, hopefully you've drained your cappings as good as possible. If you want to spread them out in, um, on a, um, a piece of cloth or something for a little while, the bees are happy with foraging on something else so it won't get them too excited, you can do that and have them outside just to get a little drier. But there is a chance there will be a pretty good amount of honey in these cappings. So your first time melting them um, and everything becomes liquid in your, your pot, right? You're gonna have to strain it um, into something. So you'll have a second container. Could be, um, sometimes I'll use like a container that I bought that had juice in it. But again, be mindful because if the plastic is too soft, it could melt when you pour this hot um, honey and wax in. So there is a, a denser plastic. It's the kind that we use to get um, water in. Uh, if you go to uh, purchase water at a machine that's filtered, it's the PET quality plastic. It's a real durable plastic. Usually can handle that, but you want to pass it through a filter. Again, I'm going to go back to the t-shirt um, that you didn't want to wear and you saved and you started cutting up. By now, you're probably into your second t-shirt <laughs> or somebody else's t-shirt that they didn't want. And you can uh, drape that across the second container and pour the wax and honey through to trap any debris or filter out any particulate. Um, and you're going to let that cool. If you can't come across a container that you find will be safe or suitable, um, you can use... Um, uh, there's a, a soft... Uh, I'm trying to think of the word for it... Um, Silicone, like a silicone uh, bowl. I've been using those a lot. They're real popular now for baking and all. you can actually bake in a silicone. Some of them are rated for heat. Um, so those are real handy to pour your filtered wax into and you're gonna allow it to cool. And what'll happen is the honey will be on the bottom liquid, uh, a little dark in color because you've put a pretty good deal of heat on it and you may use it for baking, but you may decide not to use it at all for, for consumption. Um, and then your wax cake will be above it. So after it cools, you'll have this beautiful filtered blocks, uh, block of wax that you can rinse off the honey, let it dry. And if you have the weight that you need, again, I would, I would recommend preparing a little extra 
um, you can go ahead and prepare your wax block. So the type of pan that you would use is the same kind of pan that you would use to bake a cake. It's just a round pan. Usually the weight and the depth of the, um, the block is gonna be noted in the rules. So it will say, uh, for example, one and a half to two pounds is required uh, uh, between one and two inches of depth. So I have just a simple cake pan here to show you. And you may have to experiment a little bit with these pans to find one that is the right diameter to hold the volume of wax that you're gonna be trying to make a cake out of. So there is a bit of skill there. And the other thing, you probably can't see it too easy, but this pan has already been used once for baking and somebody decided to use a knife inside of it to cut the cake or whatever was in it. So it has a couple of those scratches already in it. I wouldn't recommend using this pan for your wax block. I, I would go ahead and buy or, or try to find a new pan that doesn't have that issue so that when you pour this, the surface is ex extremely um, perfect. Um, you're gonna wanna have a, a place set up in your kitchen or uh, an area where it's nice and quiet, probably towards the evening when you're about to retire for the night and you've got your wax, um, that you your cake that's already been cooled, you've rinsed off the honey and you've dried it. Now you're gonna go ahead and melt it a second time. Use gentle heat each time because you wanna retain all the delicious aromas and fragrances from this wax. And so slowly melt this wax and when it's liquid, you're gonna pour it into this pan. I recommend setting the pan someplace where you know it's level, a level surface. And if you have an actual level, you can set that device in front of the pan and make sure it's exactly the level levelness it needs to be. Uh, and the stream of which you pour your wax in, how fast, how um, slow is gonna affect how the wax um, also sets in that pan. Um, as far as keeping the wax from sticking to the pan, that's a whole nother trick. I've had um, people share with me all kinds of tips over the years. I've tried dish soap, uh, just a very thin layer of dish soap rubbed gently around the inside of the pan. Um, some people will actually use a spray that is made and sold for the purpose of keeping wax from sticking to the candle molds that they use. Um, that silicone spray is okay, but it does leave sometimes a little bit of a film on the outside but you can try either or, or both of those. You can also try nothing uh, and then putting the pan um, in the area that you want it to rest for the evening because you know nobody's gonna be walking through the kitchen and making bumps and disturbing your wax because as it cools, you want it to cool slowly and without disturbance. So you might chuckle at this too. You could kind of give it like tuck it in, give it like a little blanket or a little insulation around it so that it cools slowly. The quicker the wax cools, the, the more likely it may show some cracks or ripples or texture in the cake itself. So again, this is one of the more tricky um, things to do. And I've seen a lot of wax cakes in the shows over the years. So I'm gonna encourage you to practice. I'm gonna encourage the show committee to be very forgiving and understanding um, as people are doing this and learning for the first time and award prizes even to some that have flaws, but keep at it because um, there's some really great entries to be made out of wax, um, including the candle entries, which we're gonna talk about next, but try to let your wax cake cool. And when it is cool all the way, if you haven't prepped your pan with any kind of um, silicone spray or soap, you could put it in the refrigerator or freezer just for a short period of time. And at that point, when you take it out, you could give it a good little tap and it should um, dislodge itself from the pan and come out easily. And don't say any bad curse words or get upset or frustrated if it doesn't work out the first time because you may have to practice it several times until you get it just right. Um, I have been through that and I still keep trying, so don't give up. <laughs> um, if, if there's no questions, I can take a second for questions on this before we go to the candles, Richard, if you want. I learned, I learned something new myself today because I, I make a lot of wax. Um, we produce a lot of wax and I, I, I saw this, I've seen this picture before on the internet and I always marveled at how did they get the wax almost identical and so beautiful. But then I saw you pull out your nice little baking pan and I said, ah, oh, God, <laughs> I should have thought of that. But it's, it's really nice, very, very nice, very yeah. pretty. 
Very pretty, very, very pretty. Um, just, there was just one question I saw. Um, I saw somebody asked, uh, I answered them, but you can't use plastic, no use of plastic foundation in you know, doing the honey on comb. Has to, you can't use plastic foundation. No. no. Sorry, 100% wax for that and either the bees doing it or you introducing the thin surplus um, foundation to the bees yeah. is the um, way to go. Who else have got, somebody's got their hand up. Let me see whose hand is up. Da, da, da. Okay, Emily, oh no, Emily put her hand down. That's not fair, Emily. <laughs> you put your hand down before I could unmute your mic. Um, anybody got any questions? Okay, Jamila. Repeat from after you reheat. Uh, okay, um, Jamila asks, can you repeat from after where you reheat the wax and the honey mix, please? Sure. So the first time you're gonna take the cappings into the, the two pots, one pot is larger with water in it and the other pot is smaller. The cappings go in and you bring that hot water to um, a boil, turn it down to a very low simmer and slowly and carefully um, and stay attending to, you know, attend it. You're gonna uh, let that all become liquid. Um, then you're gonna have a second container where you have the filter, like the t-shirt material. And it could be a silicone bowl or an adequate piece of um, plastic or even another pot if you wish. And you're gonna pour all of that liquid in and you're gonna end up uh, letting that cool to the temperature where the wax cake is hard and the honey is uh, liquid underneath. So you're going to remove the wax cake and wash it, you know, all the honey off of it and let it dry. And then when you're ready to pour your wax cake, you've got your pan ready, your level ready. It's, it's nighttime. You're going to bed. You're in a really good mood. Everything's going great. Um, you're going to take that cake of wax and you're going to bring it to a liquid state again. Again, slowly. You don't want to overcook it. Um, it it'll get it, lose all of its scent, have a darker, more, uh, burnt smell to it. You want it to be amazing. And you're choosing wax that smells really good from the beginning. So it's just like your honey. You want to choose your best, um, really light colored, uh, yellow, uh, fragrant, delicious, no smoke, um, no other off chemicals wax. So you melt that slowly. And then um, if you feel like you want to filter it again, you can. Okay. This is up to you. You, you, have the opportunity to filter this wax until you feel like it has no sediment left in it. So, but I usually can do it in one, you know, one pass. So you get it liquid and you're ready to pour it in your pan carefully, not quite super fast. So the stream should be steady and in an area that's not being disturbed so that um, it's level and then you can let it cool slowly. Sometimes I'll put a little towel or blankie or something around it. And then even the oven is a great place to put it for the night because you close the door. It's, it's free from, from everything in the, the room that could be a fan blowing or uh, you know hair or dust or something just might get in there. So the oven is nice and it cools slowly in there because it's sort of an insulated area. Um, hopefully that helps. Uh, Suzette Walters has a question. I'm gonna un... Suzette, can you unmute your mic and ask your question, please? Suzette, unmute your mic and ask your well, question. Well, good. Yes, good morning. I have. I have. Ten. Are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. Go ahead, please. <clears throat> okay. Good. Good. It's morning here. Good morning. Um, she said that to get the wax out, we could use a little dish soap to sort of coat the pan. Wouldn't that leave a smell in the wax? Usually, you, if you use something um, that doesn't have a scent, uh, it's okay. And at this stage, after the wax is removed, um, you will have the opportunity to um, clean it uh, if you need to. You can uh, rinse it and let it dry. And then you can even polish it a little bit with, um, with a cloth, like, um, like a nylon cloth, or um, I wanna say a handkerchief, like a satin handkerchief. Um, so if you see that your wax is a little bit um, dull looking, you can give it a little shine, but that little film of um, dish soap can come off pretty easy from just a little, a little rinse. 
right. <clears throat> Susa, I hope that answers your question. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, great stuff. Okay. Yes, that, yes, that, that did it. Okay, great, great. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, any more questions? Okay, so let's, um, let's push on. Let's, let's push talk, on. Let's yeah, push on. yeah let's, let's talk about there. candles. Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, la, 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 la. where is my screen? Let's reshare, share, reshare the screen. All right, so yours. Great, thank you so much. So candles is another really popular class in honey shows. And I don't know how many of you are already making candles, but it's something I really enjoy doing. I know Richard said he also produces a lot of wax. And, um, you know, at some point you've got to have something to do with all of this wax, right? Um, we are lucky enough to have a lot of people in the area that produce beauty products. And so they will purchase um, some of our wax from us. Also people who make their own candles and, and soaps and things like that. So we have an outlet for moving some volume of wax, but I personally love making candles. So I make a, a good deal of them regularly. Um, so there's all sorts of molds out there, both simple and ornate and complex with detail. And I, um, there's usually a few classes available in different honey shows. One of them is decorative candles. So the ones that have decoration and um, then there's the, the rolled candles. So this is the thin surplus foundation where you actually just roll the candle with the foundation. And then there's tapered candles, which are um, usually dipped candles. And those are a great deal of skill, I think, to make those. Um, if, if some of you are out there that already are uh, proficient at making them, maybe you could come visit me and help me uh, learn how to make them because I love them. But um, I've usually just been using the molds for the taper candles because they're so difficult to do and time consuming. Um, but these are really great things to do um, with your beeswax. The molds you can find are made with silicone. You can get them from a lot of the beekeeping supply companies, or maybe you'd like to find something that you like that's a, a, a statue or something you enjoy um, from your personality or your um, what you enjoy to do in your life. And you might like somebody to make a mold for you out of that. And you can you can probably find somebody that can help you do that with some some rubber or silicone that you purchase from like the hardware store. And you could even use something from the kitchen, like a can. So really it could be very simple, but the idea behind it is very similar to making the honey entries. If you're gonna have a candle class in the honey show, there's usually a requirement on having three candles. Um, in the case of the tapered candles, it's a pair, a pair of two or two pairs of two. And this is increasing the difficulty because each candle needs to be exactly the same. So one of the first tips I'll give you is again, choose your best wax. Your capping's wax is usually your best wax. And we just talked a pretty good amount about getting it prepared for making your beeswax block. So you'll be using the same technique um, if you're doing that. Um, I should mention too, with honey shows, most of the requirements for honey shows is that the beekeeper produce the wax or the honey that they're entering in the show. And um, that's a pretty common requirement. Um, it's up to the organization if they'd like to do that. Um, sometimes you'll find that uh, is pretty common, but um, with art and photography and baked goods and even mead, you'll allow your entrance to purchase honey um, to make those items. So they don't necessarily have to have their own bees or be a beekeeper. Again, this is up to the organization, but I just want to share a little bit about that with you. When you're making candles with a candle mold, the difficulty in making a tripl triplicate of exact matching candles is that one mold may be different from another. So my, my next tip is not to think about having three or four molds of the same thing, because ideally, if you're gonna make these candles, you're gonna have to use that same mold over and over again and make about six or seven candles until you get three that seem exactly the same. It may, you may think that the, if you purchase more than one mold of the same um, decoration, it may be exactly the same, but it could just be that one little thing that's off about it that would make it so your candles wouldn't win a first place. The other thing that you have control over is uh, weighing the wax. So you can um, decide how much wax fits in the mold. 
the molds that I purchased from one of our distributors actually tells us in ounces how much wax fits inside the candle mold. And they even go so far as to tell us a suggestion of what type of wick to use, since the wicking is important too, because if we don't choose the proper wicking or have it prepared in the candle mold right, the candle won't burn correctly. And the judges aren't just looking for the decoration on the candles, the color of the wax, the aroma, and the fact that they're all, all poured exactly the same, they're gonna actually light one of your candles and test burn it and make sure that it burns properly. So you'll have to perform this kind of test burn yourself on your candles. So you're gonna be busy making a lot of candles in order to get ready for this honey show. And the reason that you do this is because when you sell candles to the consumer, you wanna give them something they're gonna enjoy and is gonna burn properly and the flame isn't gonna go out or be too big and too hot. And you want them to come back and buy candles from you over and over again, because not only did they enjoy the color and fragrance and decoration of your candle, but it burned for a long time um, and they felt like they got a good value from, from the purchase. So that's why those um, requirements are set forth um, by the show uh, organization so that you can have something that you can then sell to the consumer that's of great value. Um, so those are some of the things that you really need to be mindful of. And now, if Richard, you would um, give me the yes. screen for a minute. No, I'll share the screen. Stop share. Okay. So this is just an example of one candle mold that I use here and the actual wick that is in it. And, and what I've noted on the outside in marker, I know it's backwards to you because of the, the way that the screen is. Um, you're seeing it backwards, correct? <laughs> yes. It's showing the actual wick number and how much volume of um, wax fits inside. So I use the, a marker to put that on my candle molds so that I don't have to do too much investigation before I pour some candles if I'm making a decision based on the show and even how much wax I have on hand. Because depending on the time of year, um, these items are very valuable and sometimes scarce. So it comes to winter and we don't have as much honey or we don't have as much wax to work with. So we have to think Am I gonna make three giant candles or maybe I'm gonna make some smaller candles because that's what I have available right now. So that's another um, I, uh, you know, tip. Now, when you're pouring these candles, it's very similar to making the beeswax block. You might wanna do it in the evening. You might wanna have a surface area that's level where you know it's very flat. Um, and you, you can use a couple of very simple tools. Um, this is something I wish I had available all the time, but this is just a simple clothespin. You can see wax all over it, but I don't have a clothesline for hanging my clothes right now, and I should because it's such a, a, um, a difficult thing to use an electric dryer to heat all the clothes, especially living in a place where there's so much sunshine. Um, but this is just a simple, simple tool that you can use. And then this is just a pair of um, chopsticks or bamboo or wood skewers and that's what I use when I make candles. So I have my mold set somewhere level and free from a draft and um, disturbance. And I set the wood um, sticks on top and then I use the clothespin to hold the wick on top. These raise up the, <clears throat> the sides of the mold so that when you go to pour the, the wax in and you hold the wick up with the, toothpick, with the uh, clothespin, it doesn't sit in the wax. And if you, Pour the wax too high in the mold, it'll run out. So be careful as you're pouring. Um, and if you pour it too low, um, it might not have a, a good bottom on it. So try to fill the cavity of the, the mold because the wax will shrink a little bit as it's um, cooling. And you want to have a nice even candle when you take it out. And here's an example of a candle that has an awful bottom. So just so you can see what you don't want to have happen, you want it to be smooth and flat a lot like the bottom of this candle, which is a tapered candle. Um, the wick is in the center and the bottom of the candle is flush and clean and flat. And when you stand it up, it sits, it doesn't wobble around very much. So that's part of the technique of making um, all of these different candles. And then the wick itself, um, the, when you go to cut the wick, try to make a measurement of about a half of an inch of height of wick above the candle before you cut it. And then in order to present it to the judge, give the wick just a little bit of a bend like this. This is gonna make it easy for your customer or your judge to light the wick. 
okay? Um, and then you're gonna do a test burn like we talked about before, at least an hour. You wanna uh, light your candle and let it burn for an hour and watch that the flame doesn't go out. And you wanna watch that the flame is a good height, not too big, not too small, and that the wax is starting to melt down evenly. And when you're ready to extinguish your wick, just put your hand in front of the flame and blow a little bit around it and it will, it will go out nicely. Um, the other thing you can do is take this stick and push the, the flame into the liquid wax and then stand it back up right away. And then your wick will have wax on it for the next time you need to burn it. So that's how you would pour your candles, um, test your candles. And then one other tip about taper candles, if you're gonna make them, when choosing them, you wanna roll them on a flat surface and make sure that they roll uh, not wobbly, okay? So you can, you can take your best of all of your tapered candles to the show, um, but that's one, one other trick that I like to share with people about candles. Any, any questions about candles? Um, yeah, Jamila Francis has a question again. I'm gonna unmute Jamila so she can ask a question. Hi, uh, Jamila, you're, you can, if you unmute your mic, you can ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jamila. Okay, so the the tiny mold, the, the beeswax mold, do yes. you put a hole at the bottom to pull the wick through? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a hole here in the center. And some candle um, companies that sell these molds, the hole is already there and some it's not. And you have to make it yourself with something sharp, like a, a needle. Um, I sometimes will use like a paper clip because I can bend the end of the paper clip and use it like a needle. I can put the wick through and then you have to find the center as best as you can and then um, push it through. Always put extra wick in there. It'll make it so much easier to make multiple candles. If you use a couple feet or a couple yards of wicking, um, you know, it's a good tip. And then some of the molds have uh, a slice in them, so it's easy to get the candle out after you make it. Some of them don't, and you have to sort of push the candle out with your right. fingers. Um, and then if, if they have this, this slice, you need the rubber band. Otherwise, the candle wax will leak out all over the place. Work in an area that has a lot of um, cardboard laid out on the counter or paper bags on the counter or, or something because you're, um, once you start working in your area with wax, um, you're gonna either need to redo your entire kitchen. Um, you can ask my husband about this. There's no place in my kitchen that there isn't wax. It's a good thing. It's nice for furniture polish and everything because um, we have a lot of wax everywhere now. Um, but do take great care because the wax is very hot, not to burn yourself. Um, you know, be near a, a, an area where there's some cold running water in case you get a little hot wax on yourself. Um, so take great care. Again, be in a good mood, calm, have all your supplies ready to make your candles and make as many extra as you possibly can so that you can pick your best candles. Cool. Thank you. Good. So to answer your question, Jamila. Awesome. Yes, it did. Great stuff. Great stuff. Okay, um, you wanna push on, Jennifer? Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about beauty products and then if you wanna take a short break after that, we can. Um, I don't know if I shared a photo of beauty products, but we can go to the next slide. Uh, next and, slide is the cakes, it's the cakes. Okay, so let me just grab um, a jar of some, um, some Sorry. cream that I, no, it's fine. I'm going to grab a quick jar of cream to show you. Sorry, the next the next slide is uh, dry mead. The mead is the next okay. one, your favorite, mead. Mead is the next slide. So I just stepped away to grab two, two beauty products to show you. Um, should you like to have this class, um, I've got a bar of soap that I made here and um, a jar of cream and it's just a hand and body cream. 
And in the beeswax class, if you're going to do the beauty products, you would use beeswax as the ingredient in one of the beauty in the beauty product that you produce. So it could be anything from a lip balm or a lotion or a bar of soap to a salve or um, a perfume um, balm or something. There's a lot of possibilities out there. Um, just be sure that you follow the rules um, and have some of your wax or wax and honey incorporated into um, the recipe. Um, and if you have any questions about any of that, we can talk about it. It's, it's a nice class because you could, the organization could make it so that um, you purchase the beeswax. So it, it opens it up to more people that can participate. Um, it's also a nice class because it's creative and a a lot of us like to do fun things with the products from, from the bees. Um, so it really can showcase some interesting uh, things. Maybe you're creating something nobody's ever done. That's always exciting. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about that class. Um, but yeah, we can move right on to meat if you like. I, I think that's the next slide, but I just have one question um, on the, uh, on, on the, um, on the, um, the cosmetics products uh, is um, is there a specific percentage value of honey or wax that needs to be included in the product? Not usually, unless there's a recipe that everybody's following uh, uniformly, um, which is the case with the cakes, the honey cakes. Um, not usually. It's just a matter of saying that there is some beeswax or honey or both in the recipe. And the recipe is usually provided on an index card or a piece of paper um, with the process. So you would write up the recipe and then you would write up the process of how you made the soap or made the cream. Um, and then you would provide the example for the judges to actually sample or try um, themselves. Um. We have a question. Okay, I've got two questions. Um, let's see if we can get Clive. Let's see if I can find Clive Dieterville to ask his question. Clive. Clive, could you unmute your mic and ask your question, please, sir? Clive, unmute, unmute and ask your question, Clive. Uh, hi, hey. hi, good. Good morning. It's actually his Hi. <laughs> Okay. My question is, what about the um, scented candles? How do you add scents to the candles? Thank you. Sure. So usually with this type of honey show, the candles are not scented unless they're being entered into a different type of class like um, art or photography, uh, you know, there's like a class that, it, you know, doesn't have any stricter requirements, just the straight wax classes. Um, judges are usually looking for the wax to be natural, just the way you um, got it from the bees, no scenting. Thank you. Of course. My pleasure. Right. hope that answers your question. All right. Um, we have another question. Um, we have another question from Kupret Singh. Let me try and find. Okay. Kupret Singh, if that's the correct enunciation, can you unmute your mic and ask your question, please? Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, Kupret. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my question are the what are the uh, cotton thread do the this uh, thread are used for burning? Can you repeat that? Your signal is your signal is not so good. Could you repeat your question, please? What cotton thread does this thread use for burning? I still didn't cotton. quite catch you, sir. Could you repeat, please? Uh, cotton are not to, uh, cotton use. What I, I just got the last word use. That's all I could hear. What cotton thread does this thread use for burning? For candle question, sir. A candle question. Huh. Uh, what okay, what cotton thread does you do you use? What thread do you use for for, for the candle? Yes, so yes, there, yes, yes. <clears throat> wonder that's a wonderful question. Thank you so much. 
So there are a lot of options out there for using um, different types of wicking. Um, cotton wicking is a very good and very common style of wick that you can get from a beekeeping supply company or a candle supply company. Um, we don't usually use anything that has any nylon or um, metal like lead added because those are sometimes choices that are available. Um, cotton ply wicking, either braided wicking, um, there's a round and flat braided wicking. Um, I usually uh, test my candles with the type of wicking that is re recommended. There's a chart you can look up online uh, for the wicking um, for the size of the diameter of the candle and the style of the candle. So you might find a chart that says for uh, one half inch to one inch taper candle use a number four wick. So there are all these different um, numbers associated with the wicks. Um, the one that I just showed you for the, the cavity for the mold that I was showing you has a flat braided cotton wick and the name of it is 60 ply. So it's a, a interesting name. It's a not as common as some of the other numbers that we use. Uh, some of the other common ones I use for the smaller candles are uh, two, uh, two slash zero and four slash zero. Those are some very common wick numbers that you can find that are made of cotton that work very good for some smaller candles that are usually um, about two inches tall and one or two inches in diameter. I hope that's helpful. Okay, thank, thank you thanks, much sir. for that question. Good printing. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so we can move on to the next subject. Or... Great, absolutely. So we can so talk about is... mead, yes. We can go on to yeah, mead. Yeah, we, we like to talk about mead. <laughs> this, is, this is one of my favorites. Um, we here in the shop that we just opened are waiting very patiently for the state that regulates the alcohol licensing to give us a um, permit where we can actually be a winery and start making mead here in house. So it's a, a passion of mine to make mead. I love it so much. Um, taking honey and water um, and combining them to produce this delicious beverage has uh, been happening all throughout um, human uh, history and, and things that are documented go back as far as you could imagine where people discuss their tricks and recipes and, and things that they did to make mead. Um, the picture you see here in the slide is a fun one. It is the visit I told you about earlier where I actually got to go to England to the National Honey Show. I hope you all can go someday. Um, they have uh, about 30 classes for mead in their honey show. Um, which is huge, um, unless you're going to a show specifically devoted to brewing or mead. Um, I don't know that there's another one that has that many classes. So this is just one wall in the room I was in. I got the great opportunity to be a steward uh, of the mead room. So I didn't witness all of the judging and I can't imagine how long it must have taken them to taste. This is just a, per a small percentage of all of the entries for that show but there were a few judges at the end that took all of the first places from each class and I did get get to witness this part it was it was pretty extraordinary um, they tasted each first place from each class to determine the best in show for all of the mead classes um, and lucky me they gave me a little taste and it was probably some of the most delicious mead that has ever passed my lips um, so it gave me the enthusiasm and encouragement that um, sets sort of a, a place uh, of achievement for producing mead and having a good quality mead and, and wanting to learn more about it. So if you've never had the opportunity, um, let me encourage you that mead is something very simple that you can do at home with a little bit of honey and water, um, a small amount of honey. Um, usually if I'm making a small batch, like a gallon container, I would take about three pounds of honey and the rest of the volume to fill up the container of water. And if you don't have access to a yeast that's produced commercially, you can still make mead, no worries, because nature provides and there's yeast um, present in the honey and in your environment. So you can still make a nice batch of mead. I always recommend starting uh, for the first time using a recipe. Um, thankfully, we all have access, most of us, right, have access to um, 
uh, other people that we can talk to, books and the computer, which gives us the ability to search for things. So you can find a nice recipe. If you don't find one, I'm willing to share a recipe, no problem. Um, but basically you combine honey and water and allow it to sit. The yeasts that are naturally present will convert the sugars in your honey to alcohol. Um, and that usually takes a few weeks. Um, mead gets better with age, usually a good year at the very minimum for a nice young mead to start to taste good. Um, and so there's quite a bit um, of skill to develop to make a really nice tasting mead. Again, you can use fruit and herbs and spices and things that are naturally occurring in your area to highlight and feature um, things that are special about where you live, including the honey. Um, it's a big category. I could spend all day just on it, but I'm going to move on to getting it ready for a honey show. So you've made mead and um, one style of mead is just the simple version of honey and water without any additives. And you're going to do the same thing you did with mead that you did for extracting honey um, and making your wax cakes and your comb and section and section and chunk comb. And you're going to choose your best tasting honey. Um, you People will always ask if they can take a honey that's slightly fermented or has an off flavor or something off about it, high moisture, and make it into mead. And my answer is yes, you can, but it may not have a better flavor and likely won't once it's produced into alcohol. That, that uh, flavor that was there before will still likely present itself or alter the mead in a way that isn't desirable. So especially if you're going to go through the great deal of um, effort to be ready for a honey show, I'm going to go ahead and recommend you use your best honey um, and the cleanest water you can get your hands on, filtered water, not distilled water. Um, distilled water is really lacking in flavor. Um, all the minerals and everything about it has been removed, but a nice filtered water, um, if you have access to fresh spring water, even better. Um, anything you can do to get a, a water that has a nice flavor and a honey that has a nice flavor. If you have access to commercially produced yeast, yeast um, it gets rehydrated and added to the honey and water. Um, the yeast itself is just a really, um, a way to guarantee that the sugars are converted into alcohol. Um, so you're not relying on nature. Um, you're giving it the advantage of making sure that there's a yeast present. Um, and that's something you can um, experiment with. Um, to get ready for a honey show, you're gonna take mead that you produced um, hopefully a year prior, and you're going to have several bottles. Um, usually you only need one bottle for a class, so it's not like the other classes where you have to have three identical entries, because um, it's hard enough just to make a really good mead sometimes. So <laughs> one, one really good bottle will do the trick. And depending on how much sugar you started with and honey, uh, your mead will end up being dry or sweet, your traditional mead. So your honey show may have a separate class for dry or sweet, or they may just have one class for traditional mead, just honey, no added flavors, and they may allow both dry and sweet mead to be in that class. Um, and when you're getting your mead ready, the one important thing is you have the extra bottles and they've been aging for quite some time, almost you know a year or longer. Um, and lots of things can happen in that time. Your corks could degrade, or maybe you thought you got the cork um, in the bottle properly when you um, put it in the bottle, but it wasn't quite right. So some air got in and your mead turned to vinegar, or um, when you <laughs> transferred, <laughs> happens to the best of us, when you transferred your mead, there was a little sediment in there that you didn't notice. Um, so when you go to um, get this mead ready, I recommend wherever you store it, it's a cool and dark area and you bring the bottles out in advance and you stand them up. This way the sediment can settle to the bottom and the nice clear mead that you want for show is at the top. And you're gonna be siphoning some of this clear mead into a bottle that is the right bottle for what the show requires. So in the rules and regulations, the show will specify a size and usually it's a 750 milliliter bottle. This is a pretty typical size wine bottle. And um, it will also mention the type of cork to use, usually a standard cork or what they call a tea cork. The tea cork is um, the type of cork that has a little plastic round top and a cork, a natural cork underneath. And these are used once wine bottles are open 
to make it easier to open and close um, for the duration of the rest of, um, you know, drinking and, and using the mead or wine. So you can look that one up. It's, uh, it's just a small little cork that is not as troublesome to remove. You don't need any special, uh, you know, corker or uh, device to try to get these tea corks out. They're very simple to use. So a lot of honey shows like them because it's easier for the judges to take those corks out. Um, but whatever the show decides to do, you'll, you'll follow the rules for the type of bottle. And again, you're going to clean everything just as you did with the other entries earlier. You're going to, you're going to wash out your bottles, make sure they're dry, um, no sediment, no, uh, you know, bubble, uh, film or soap or anything. And then you're going to carefully siphon or pour your mead into your bottle to get it ready for the show. But before you do that, here's what I recommend. Open each bottle. I, if I were to make one bottle of mead for a show, I would start with three bottles of my, my favorite mead that has been aging. I would take them all out, let them sit on a counter in a cool, dark place for a couple days to settle. And then I would uncork each one carefully and I would smell um, the aroma from the bottle as I remove the cork. Sometimes you'll notice something that's off, like a musty smell or a, a chemical smell or something. And believe me, it's easy to, to not remember to do this because I've done it before where I've had this wonderful mead because I opened one bottle and I, I tested it and it was delicious. And the same meads from the same batch I didn't test. And I combined the three and went through the process of making sure the mead was flawless the bottle was filled properly, the cork was beautiful, the bottle was polished, but I served the judges a mead that maybe had a contamination from air or something, and they spit it out. Oh my <laughs> so, gosh. Oh yeah. man. So, so do yourself the favor of opening and testing each mead before you prepare your bottle. Um, and you slightly, you very carefully siphon or pour this mead into your bottle, and you want to fill it to the proper level. And I know we talked earlier about filling your honey jars exactly to the top of that one ring around the top of the um, jar right above the shoulders underneath the threads. Well, for mead, you know, you have a cork that's going to go in the bottle and the cork, once it's put placed in the bottle, should be seated just below the top of the bottle. We say an eighth of an inch, but it's really just a very small amount of space. So when you're using a corker to place your cork in, and this is a special device that you may have to purchase, or you may have to find someone that has one to borrow um, to get your corks in, because corks are very um, snug when they go into these bottles. It really isn't something you can do by hand. You need this either hand corking device or what they call a floor corking device. And um, the corks get pushed into the bottle and it really needs to be calibrated so that the cork sits just under the top edge of the bottle. Um, and then the level of mead should be about a half inch below the bottom of that cork. And I can show you that now if Richard, you have a, a second to uh, let me have the screen. So now I pulled this bottle of mead out to bring. And again, it shows you um, more flaws than uh, perfection. And so we have a cork that is slightly under the surface, but really should be a little lower. It's, it's really just at the very top. So I would recalibrate my corker. So this cork would just go just a little bit lower than that. An eighth of an inch is perfect. I also, maybe you can see that this cork is a little wet here. So this bottle has been laying on its side for about four years. And my job is to rotate the bottle every year and make sure the cork doesn't have any damage. But this has been sitting for probably two or three years without any monitoring. And I've got some damage here and I've likely got some oxidation because I have some degraded cork on the side here. Um, this isn't a mead that I liked a lot after it was produced and I didn't have high hopes for it. So I'm not imagining that it's much better now. But this is the bottom level of the cork right here. And if I was to fill this for a honey show, I would get out a ruler and I would fill the jar, the bottle just a half inch below that cork. So you would hold the cork outside the bottle before you um, seat it in there. And you would carefully put all that delicious mead that you've tested in um, and you would stop right at that half of an inch below level. And then you would seat your cork in there. And that would be uh, adequate for the show. Again, you want to make sure and test each 
little drop of mead that you're going to put in that bottle. And if you feel like you need to filter the mead for any reason, if there's any kind of chance that there's any sediment or something in the environment that might get in there, you can use um, a funnel and a, a paper coffee filter or something like the cotton t-shirt. The cotton t-shirt is going to be something you're going to never stop thinking about after this presentation. Um, but something just that would carefully remove possibly any sediment. Again, you want the clearest uh, mead you can. And, uh, and you want the fermentation to have completely um, happened, and not any more fermentation happening. So no bubbling. If you notice bubbling after you cork your mead, all of the sugars may not have been properly uh, converted into alcohol. And so you may have some incomplete fermentation. Um, and if it tastes particularly sweet, um, that's another indication that you may not have um, completed fermentation. Doesn't mean that it's bad, but it's just um, could cause some pressure inside the bottle. And when you go to open it, it the cork may pop out, um, but that wouldn't be a good mead for, for the competition. So there's a lot to learn about mead to really get a good entry. Again, I would, I would ask the show committee to be uh, forgiving and understanding and allow people to feel encouraged and start producing meads now. Um, and if you've got some meads going, I'm, I'm excited to hear about it sometime um, so that you can have something nice to enter in the show. All right, that's great. Um, I have a quick question from Jamila. She's swinging us back to beauty products. No problem. Um, let me let Jamila ask a question. Jamila, you can go ahead, unmute your mic and please ask your question. Okay, previously somebody asked about scented candles. Um, I was wondering, and you said it's just keep it simple. Um, I was wondering for the soaps and other beauty products, can you add other things to that beeswax um, or just keep it simple just, just the same way? I definitely recommend adding some things to the beauty products. Um, you can also leave it natural if you want, but like here's a bar of soap that I used, a little bit of um, like a natural mineral pigment to make a little coloring. And I've added some mint and um, uh, raspberry essential oils and uh, fragrances to the soap. And I would expect that the judge, you know, if they found the scent appealing, um, and the soap worked really well, and that included some beeswax and honey, that that might be a good scoring item. Um, and then the same goes for uh, this cream that we make. It's a hand and body cream. We use our own wax and honey in this hand and body cream, but we also make all of the tinctures um, that are in there with the herbs, and we use a lot of healthy oils, and so there is a little fragrance to it. And again, we add propolis to this as well. So we would think that it might be a nice item um, for the judges to um, try, even though there's some things that have been added to it. So yeah, I think that the, the beauty products class is a nice way for you to experiment with your wax and your honey and be able to add some other additional ingredients and fragrances. Great. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, no worries. Is there a standard size? For example, would, it, would you have to present in a particular size jar, like two ounce jars for your creams? and four ounce molds or two ounce molds. Is there a, st a standard size that you're looking for or, or it, doesn't, it doesn't matter? Usually with the beauty products, it's not um, a standard size unless it's noted in the rules. And again, I usually ask the um, Honey Show to be a little lenient with that type of thing, unless they're looking to see that somebody can make something in um, duplicates or triplicates to have um, uh, the exact look or exact texture or exact fill level. Um, but standard, uh, no, usually not. Usually you can just make one of something and no particular size. Okay, thank you. Of course. All right, um, we have a question from Karen Cumberbatch. Karen, let's see if we can get Karen up to ask a question. Hi, Karen. Oops, nope, yeah. Um, Where, for example. Hi, Karen, you can go ahead with your question, please. I, I just basically want to know, I, I know you're talking about the honey show and showcasing the products. And I recognize that Jennifer made mention of soaps and lotions. So I was just wondering if there's a program or a course that would teach you how to actually make these things. What country are you in? Barbados. 
uh, Barbados. Um, you, I would suggest you reach out to you know your your local Ministry of Agriculture, the Business Development Unit. Mm -hmm. um, there should be some help there. Um, okay. Uh, but you know, but Jennifer, you may have some suggestions. I'm not sure. There sure. should be other stuff online. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of stuff online. There's some great books out there. Um, if you want to reach out to me after this, I can try to look up. I have a couple of really nice books. One is called Beeswax Craft. Okay. Um, I forget the author's name, but the woman, Carla, that's going to be on tomorrow, um, mm -hmm. actually had the author um, slated to visit for one of the conferences that got um, canceled uh, due to COVID. But okay. Carla has a really nice website with some resources, and we're... Um, planning something in April online as well. And I'm going to be doing um, some beeswax candles and beeswax rendering. So if you can attend that, I will um, definitely cover some of that um, in that hands-on education. Okay, yeah. sounds if, good. If you're in St. Lucia, St. Vincent, St. Kitts, Grenada, Dominica, Trinidad and Tobago, um, as part of our regional regional program, the regional um, uh, biodiversity, um, apiculture biodiversity program, uh, we will incorporate this, um, some level of training into soap making and candle making and so forth. And what we'll try to do is, um, Karen, as you're in, in Barbados, um, we will try, we'll try to, we'll, we'll definitely try to make that package or that offering online. So at least you can participate from Barbados and and um and get some get some um insight. We have a Great, wonderful young lady, name, wonderful young lady by the name of uh, Shamika, um, and she makes some great candle products for me, and she does some great soaps and solid. She does something called solid lotions, mm -hmm. and so forth. So um, it's something that we could definitely um look at. But as I said, for those countries in our re those countries in our in the Caribbean or in us in our sixth country regional bio, apiculture biodiversity project, they will definitely be able to um, get you up to speed in your cosmetics, um, your cosmetics production. One of the outputs from this project is to look at value added products, not just to rely so heavily on honey. Um, yeah. With climate change being a, a real reality, one year you may make, may make three or four gallons per hive, and the next year you might struggle to make two gallons per hive. So, <laughs> If you're a full-time beekeeper or a part-time beekeeper, to rely on those odds might be very difficult for you. So if you can get into making other products from the hive um, it, to supplement your income, it might be beneficial to, to you. So this is one of the things that we are looking at through our program, this our regional project. Okay. All right. So um, but should I send you more, my I'm email? A lot, of, a lot of stuff coming up online. So what I'll probably do when Jennifer does a program in April, we can probably share the links in through our network, and so everybody will be, be able to participate. Um, uh, you know, so look at we'll put you on the mailing list. Everybody who participates today will put you on our mailing list. And once Jennifer does um, organize her, her project in April, we'll definitely share the links, and you'll be able to participate. Great. Um, that way, also. All right. I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Great thing, Karen. Thanks for your question. Great stuff. Bye. Um, okay, so we've done Karen. I see a couple of questions come in. Siobhan Walker, I would also like to be a part of the April course. So you got some, you got some participants already. Um, and Ayo Xavier, heard you mention much a few different Caribbean islands. How can Antigua and Barbuda be involved, or do you have an association? Um, Ayo, unfortunately, well. We will hopefully um, in our regional project, we can upscale it again to include all the other Caribbean islands that missed out this time round. Um, we do have a regional organization, Association of Caribbean Beekeepers, um, and I will add you to the uh, mailing list. And as the, the, the weeks and months develop, there'll be a lot of initiatives that will be under, undertaken via the organization to reach out to um, countries such as Antigua. Um, if you drop me an email, I can put you in contact with your the Beekeepers Association in Antigua. I give you at least a telephone number and an email address and a contact name so you can reach out to somebody in Antigua directly that can help bring you, you know, bring your, your, your quest, bring you forward in your quest to participate in apiculture. 
All right, I hope that answers your question, Neil. Um, so, shall we push on or we're going to take a break? What do you want to do? Can we take a short break? Yeah, sure. Um, Please. Let's take a, how long are we going to do? 15 minutes? It's tw or 10 minute break? 10 minutes? 10 minutes is great. Okay, so everybody, we're going to take a 10 minute break um, and we will start at 1.30 Atlantic Standard Time, that'll be 12.30 um, Eastern Standard Time. So we'll take a 10 minute break, folks. Um, let me see if my technical team's listening and I can get them to play a nice video in a nice 50 minute, during the 15 minute program. If they, why, why we take this break? Right? So let's take a break for 10 minutes. Thank you for your time, everybody. And we'll be back. Alish, creativity and innovation. Alish, community spirit. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the Alish Creativity and Innovation Alish Community Spirit the People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Alish creativity and innovation. Alish community spirit. Alish. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Alish creativity and innovation. Alish community spirit. Alish. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Alish creativity and innovation. Alish community spirit. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Alish creativity and innovation. Alish community spirit. Alish. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. 
Unleash creativity and innovation Unleash community spirit the People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Vision and Sustainable Futures Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability Tune in to the live opening Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. In our small initiative, we managed to develop a beehive monitoring system in which beekeepers can keep track of the beehives around the year and can share the information with expert beekeepers in the group. The centralized information repository can help the beekeepers connect with buyers locally and over uh, internet where e-commerce is possible without the involvement of any middleman or agents. Our aim is to ensure better income for the beekeepers 
and pure honey for the consumers with the assistance of technology unleash creativity and innovation unleash community spirit unleash the people's knowledge fair at the ue open campus st lucia country conference 2021 phase 2 presents visioning sustainable futures confronting the threats of climate change and climate variability tune in to the live opening join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th that's not all experience st lucia's first national honey bee show training workshop on the 15th and 16th come learn from a leading international expert everything you need to know to compete in december in our first ever national honey show registration is open now the people's knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash the People's Knowledge Fair at the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021. Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures, Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability. Tune in to the live opening. Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th. That's not all. Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th. Come learn from a leading international expert everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show. Registration is open now. The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners. Welcome back, welcome back. How are we doing, Jennifer? Great. All right, so that was a great intermission there. I hope everybody had a moment to do whatever they had to do. Um, I actually found a tin of the, um, the, oh, the silicone oh. spray for, for your molds when you're making your wax. So this is what it looks like. It's um, Kami 1080. I think I bought this from Man Lake. I got my mate, my molds from Man Lake. Quick plug for Man Lake. Um, so, but that's the stuff you're looking for for your molds. Um, yeah, I um, I don't have anything. I think. Oh, I had one question for you. So, forgive my for those of you that um, speak extremely good Creole um, in this. I have a question for you. So, in in um. 
In St. Lucia, we have a tree that flowers in late September, October. Um, the Creole name for it is called Lachilamawi. Now, the honey from that tree is slightly green. How would you grade that one? <laughs> is, it, is it a light color with the hue of green or medium? It's or a dark? light color. It's a, it's a kind of like a... Um, <laughs> Oh, it's a really odd color. I think if you put that in a black light, I'm sure it'd be fluorescent. The wax from it, the wax from that tree is fluorescent green. You can, you know, wow. when it's in flower, when you see the bees put it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the comb and it'd be so, but it's fluorescent green. It's beautiful. Um, I'd love to see a picture of that sometime. Yeah, uh, October, I'll send you some pictures in October, but the honey um, has a very curious, interesting taste, very interesting taste. Yeah, um, if you get a chance to send me the name of the tree, um, I want to look up the genus too because I would be I'd be interested to see what it's related to because yeah. we probably have some similar plants mm -hmm. here. And I know between the tupelo mm -hmm. and our invasive Brazilian pepper, the mm -hmm. tupelo, the true tupelo, has a little bit of a green hue to it as well. Okay. But I don't know that the wax does. But the Brazilian pepper in the hive is like literally like fluorescent yellow <laughs> both the honey and the wax it's like it's so yellow it's unbelievable we, yes, we, yes 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 so mm. um but yeah i love the it has a very nice flavor as well my favorite there's a, a tree that also flowers at that time of the year um the creole name for it is savonet savonet tree okay. um uh the flowers we used to use it back in the days to, to wash, they, 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 the flowers love it. They, they, they wash, they used to wash with it. So it has um, like sap, saponins, saponins, yeah. like natural Maybe. soap. Yeah. Maybe, and um, they ha it has a very nice kind of taste like licorice. It's, wow. my, fa it's my favorite honey. That's why I, that's, I always keep a special couple of buckets of that for myself at the end of the year. Thanks so that's for my favorite. That. That's pretty much the most exciting part for me about this. I love sharing, but I get so excited to learn about other people, where they live. Yes, the hunting, yes. No, make. you're doing a fantastic job. I'm, I, I'm I, hands down, you know, this is really, really great, really great. I was just awesome. speaking to one of my other colleagues. Uh, can we make honey ice cream? Yes. Oh, who's that? Patricia. Cream honey? Uh, honey, a cream honey, yes, cream. Can okay. we make honey and cream honey? Yeah, yeah, so sure. Question. So, if the if you'd like to include cream honey in the show, is it something that's pretty um, common or interesting to you? There, um, do you think I know comb honey is, but do you think cream honey is something the customers are like a value added product that you think the customers? Um, there's one, I know one or two people, I know one person in St. Lucia makes it. Um, I cannot speak to the other islands. Yeah. Um, uh, but I know one one person, I know one person in St. Lucia makes it. It's pretty popular uh, here right now. And even um, some places like this came from the UK and it's not adultered at all. It's just the honey that naturally, you know, comes off the bees. The crystals are already forming but they're the sugars that have a very um, smooth texture once creamy. So 57 degrees and, and lower and the bees, you know, the sugars are already starting to. Yes. The, uh, the rape seed, the rape seed oil does that. The rape, the rape, the rape does so that. Quickly. Um, so quickly. Even I think the sunflower also sunflower does that partially, I think as well. Yeah. Sunflower typically settles though. Like you have a, a layer of creamed and then the moist, high moisture honey yes. sort of floats to the yes. top. Yeah. But if you want to make creamed honey, I just recommend taking a honey that you know will cream with a nice smooth texture, not a large sugar mm -hmm. granule, and then experiment a little with it. Here I use salt palmetto honey because it works really, really well. Um, and again, I use 57 degrees um, for a few weeks. I introduce a seed, um, which the word seed is just a, another word for a starter. Um, so if we're gonna make cream honey here, we use one part starter and about 10 parts uh, liquid honey, uh, right. a honey that, you know, and then we put it in 57 degrees after we uh, incorporate the two till there's no more streaking or, or complete uniformity is achieved. And then we put it in the jars and let it sit for a few weeks until it, it gets that, that texture, smooth, creamy, spreadable. Um, when you enter this type of honey in the show, this is actually two set. 
you know, it's, it's all, there are classes in Europe where the honey is soft set, set and very set. And um, in the U.S., we usually just have one class for cream honey. <clears throat> and what we're looking for is a cream honey that when you open the jar and you tip it slightly, it starts to break. So the honey is still set, but it starts to move just a little bit. And right. when you bring a spoon through it, it's smooth, smooth and creamy. And it doesn't fill the gap very quickly that you made with the spoon, but it will start to even back out. That's a perfect um, setness. And cream honey is great. You should all try to make it if you have access to a honey that will do that. Um, and your customers will love it. Okay. And yeah, it would be a nice nice addition to the honey show, Richard. Okay, I, we will we'll definitely consider that. Um, so, okay, my, my good friend here, Anthea, she's just giving me the scientific name for the savonet tree. <laughs> I, don't know oh. where she, I don't know where she got that from, and I will not try and embarrass myself to pronounce it, but it's in the chat. I'll probably email it to you. Maybe you could find it. I'll email it to you. It's in the chat. Local. That would be great. I would yeah, well, I'm not even going to try and pronounce a Latin name, um, but she has provided, she has provided the, um, the, uh, the Latin name for it. I've there. already um, cheated and read it and I don't know the genus, so I'm excited to learn it's, more about it. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic, it's a most, one of the most beautiful honeys you'll get um, in, in the air. It goes here, I know it's in Trinidad as well because I've seen it in Trinidad. Um, but it's a it's a really really beautiful. It's very flowery, um, very nice flowery bouquet to it. I really hope I get to visit in December and try some of these. Yes, things. man, we have to find a way to do that. We'll, you'll be in here in December, man. I, I have no I have no fear of that, man. I have no fear of that. Great. Right, I'm, I'm overly confident of that bit, uh, taking place. All right, so um, let's continue down the yellow brick road. Yeah, um, we've got more fun stuff to cover for sure. Yeah, we've got a couple of more topics to cover. Um, and we're on our cakes now. Um, yeah, yeah, baking with honey. Um, and before honey. we move on, I don't feel like I gave the flavored honey much, um, the flavored mead too much uh, uh, topic of discussion. I might just mention a little bit about that real quick and then move on to baking. But the baking slide would be perfect if you want to pull that up. Richard, whenever yeah, it's, up, it's up and running. Oh, that's great. So just to fin finish on the mead, we talked a lot about the standard mead, just honey and water. And I may, I may have mentioned just a little bit about using what you have available uh, from your region or your area. Um, and now we talked even more about the honeys that come from where you are and, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you have something special and unique that um, identifies where you are. Mm -hmm. and and I think making mead with some of those other fruits and spices is great. And so you have that class, the flavored mead class available um, to utilize. Um, so you can make the classic mead, which could be dry or sweet. And then I would highly recommend um, adding some fruit or spices to a mead. And as far as the, the recommended amount to start, if you're gonna make a small batch of mead, try to follow a recipe. If I'm doing a gallon where before we talked, I mentioned like three pounds of honey um, and then the rest water, um, you might use part of that water, uh, a juice that you made from a fruit that you're, you're wanting to feature in there, the flavor of. Um, just be careful if the fruit has any um, bitterness to it in the peel, um, like in the, in the way of citruses. Um, sometimes we'll forget that and we'll include the peel and we'll add up and ending a little bit too much bitters, but some bitter can be good. It's nice to cover all the different flavors that are um, available to the palate, the sweet, salty, bitter, spicy. Um, so you can play around with some of those things and do let me know how you enjoy making mead and what kind of results you get, especially if you try that amazing honey Richard was just talking about and make mead out of it. Um, so we're gonna move on to baking and this picture is a really nice photo just to show you how different some of the honey cakes can look from one another. Right away, your eye might go to the one in the front that looks like a light colored cake and wonder why all of the other cakes are so dark and different looking. Um, you, if, if your show would allow to have a standard recipe for your honey cake class, um, you'll find that the recipes are usually pretty uh, simple as far as the ingredients go. And we'll revert back to what we said throughout the entire presentation, use your best honeys. Um, and again, the second tip we made before about um, 
combining two honeys. Don't be afraid to blend. Um, use something a little darker or a little richer in flavor um, along with your sweets or um, other types of honeys that have more floral notes or other notes. So go ahead and blend honeys for a honey cake and you'll find that you'll get some amazing results. But the rest of the ingredients in a, a standard honey cake are pretty simple. Flour, baking soda, butter, um, and honey. And there's really a, a couple eggs. There's really not much else in it. So the skill is definitely going to be um, the baker and the size of the pan, the volume of, of the recipe, and then how you can actually bake this cake off. That's such a simple cake without it being too dark or too light, uncooked, overcooked, not risen, risen enough, cracked, no cracked. So all of you bakers out there that are tuning in, you know, the terminology I'm using is common and or you're already chuckling because you know how hard it could be to bake even a simple cake with a simple recipe. Um, but at the end of the day, if everybody has the same recipe and are, is using the same ingredients other than their honey, um, their skill is going to be the thing that determines um, the outcome of the cake. And, at, and the judge is really looking to smell and taste the honey in the cake as well as the proper bake. Um, and all of the rules were followed for the size of the cake. So there will be a, a cake pan size indicated in the rules um, that everybody should use and then a basic recipe with a basic temperature. Um, so it may seem very simple, but I will tell you that we over the years have tried so many different cakes, some of them um, unbelievable. I mean, you could smell the honey before you even cut into the cake, um, per perfectly baked, nice little um, surface um, texture, no cracks, no, um, no fallen centers. And then you cut the cake open and you find something, something, either too much baking soda or um, too dry or overbaked or underbaked. So don't let this class fool you. It's, it's, it's a lot of work to get this nice cake. And people are very eager to make the cakes. I encourage you to make the cakes, but make a few. Just like we said earlier about everything else we've talked about today, you're going to practice this cake recipe you're going to make a few. Your neighbors, your friends are all going to eat lots of cake. <laughs> Everybody's going to be um, full and very familiar of what honey cake tastes like until you get it just right so you can enter the competition. But there's really not much else to share about it other than in some places like in Europe, the National Honey Show and other places we've um, uh, either attended shows or uh, had the pleasure of judging. There can sometimes be some dried fruit added like currants. Um, but other than that, it's really a pretty standard recipe. Um, so try your hand at this and let me know what your, what your thoughts are afterwards. Um, the, the fun class for um, baking with honey is the open class. Um, this is the one where we also say the honey show staff or organization could uh, allow people that aren't beekeepers to enter and they could have purchased honey or even beekeepers could have purchased honey for this class. Um, so that's a consideration for you and, um, you can, the sky's the limit. There's no recipe. There's no, the only thing in the rules might be saying that it has to include honey in the recipe and detectable, uh, during smell or taste. So you could make a cookie, you could make a cake, a cupcake. It could be in the buttercream frosting. It could be so ornate and decorated. You could be painting bees and honeycomb all over it. So you could really have a great time with, with the open class. Um, and I personally enjoy judging the open class. I haven't met a baked goods <laughs> with honey that I didn't like. Uh, baklava is a good one. Um, there's lots of cookies and cakes. You can find recipes all over, um, all throughout history. Cultures have utilized um, honey because it's a humectant. It really uh, can improve and add some great quality to baking. You'll find it in breads, so don't hesitate to make breads. Um, honey butter. Again, I could I could probably go into a pretty deep dive on um, baked goods, but just to give you as much info as needed, you can see these are simply wrapped with some plastic wrap. There's usually a cake bag that you can get from a bakery. Um, here we have local grocery that has a cake bag, and um, sometimes when we have the honey shows, we'll go ahead and ask them if we can purchase some of these cake bags. So depending on the rules set forth for the show, you'll find out if you can simply enter your cake on a paper plate with this plastic cover over it, if, if you need to provide it, or if maybe the show, like you could bring your cake in a small container 
and that the show would be providing the paper plate and the bag is another idea. Um, and those ID labels that we talked about earlier, Richard, you may have missed this. Um, we were talking about how the show, once you um, sign in with your entry form, the um, show staff will be assigning you an entry number and also um, an entrant number and an entry uh, code so that you'll bring those labels back over with you when you're preparing your entry. And in the rules, it'll state where to put the entry labels. So you might get two for your cake. One will go on the bag on the outside and the other one might go on the paper plate when you take the cake out of the bag. This way, if the judge is judging and he's got or she's got one or two cakes out, they wouldn't make a mistake and mix up the cakes because the label is not only on the bag, but it's on the paper plate. Exactly. And at the end, the end of the day, the entrant would be assured that their entry would be properly judged and placed and there wouldn't be a mix up. So that's why that type of thing does happen. So um, baking with honey is pretty darn fun. Um, I hope all of you are excited about it. Maybe some of you already baked with honey. I do. Um, <laughs> I, we have a honey cake recipe here from one of our honey judges. Um, that is in, has been in his family for quite some time. Richard, I'll share it with you after. I um, appreciate you that. Share, appreciate yeah, you can share it with the group. It's a real nice cake recipe. It yes. uses a little bit of vegetable oil, um, some juice from an orange, some black tea, as well as flour and honey and um, a couple of other uh, additives, you know, simple things, some, some spices like clove and nutmeg and cardamom. Um, and it's a nice cake, but it is a bit of a spice cake. So we don't consider it like a standard cake recipe because there's just too much going on. Um, so You're sending me back to my days of a, as a Boy Scout when I used to bake cakes. For, uh, as a, as a Boy Scout. So you see, I, 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 you may tempt you may tempt me to go back into my um my my cake my cake baking mission days. I hope everybody gets tempted into the baking uh, arena. Again, it's a fun class. Don't let it fool you though. It, it is a bit tricky to get that standard cake recipe just right. I've made plenty of them and I honestly have never gotten one that won an award yet. So it's on my list to continue to try harder to do a great uh, standard cake. Maybe uh, even in Europe one day, I'll actually enter and place uh, a cake in a competition there. I'd be shocked if I ever got to that level because... Uh, the people that I'm uh, would be competing with would have many years experience uh, making this type of cake um, and definitely have an edge or an advantage over me. So <laughs> it's kind of nice to have that humility and share with you that. Um, it's all good you know, fun. It's all good fun. Yeah, it's good fun. So if anybody has any questions about um, baking with honey or baked goods, um, we can open it up for questions before we move on to the art and photography. No, I don't see any questions yet. What? You got? No, no questions. Amazing, amazing. We're talking about Great. food here, man. Food. No one's got any questions about food. That's quite all right. We'll get into the art and photography and Richard. Uh, no, we've got two people with their hands raised. Sorry, I I am mistaken. Oh, I I am mistaken. Um, we have two persons with the. Okay, so let's let. I don't think it's Clive, but anyway. It says Clive Dutiful, but I don't think it's Clive, but let's allow Clive to speak. Clive, can you unmute your mic, please? Yes, I can. Thank He's right you. there, don't worry. He's not too far. <laughs> my, <laughs> question, <laughs> my question is, um, is there a proportion where you can say, okay, instead of two pounds of, of sugar or one pound of sugar, then we use two cups of honey, uh, for a cake recipe or for any baked goods um, recipe, if you want to substitute sugar for honey, is there a standard um, substitution measurement that can be used? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. There's a website you can go to um, call, uh, for the National Honey Board. And on their website, they have a substitution of honey for sugar conversion chart for um, baking. And it's pretty neat to see just, you know, the amount of honey that you could use in place of sugar in a baked good. Um, and I think you'll find the chart pretty easily. But if for some reason we don't, we could try to grab that link and, and send it out to the group, Richard. Yes, definitely. I shall. It's something I'm, I'm making notes. I'm making notes. I'm making notes. Uh, National Honey, honey Board. Yes, the National Honey Board. Thank That's you. That's a great question. Thank you. All right, um, we have another hand up. We have Karen. Let me try and get Karen. Um, let's get Karen 
on the mic. Karen, can you unmute your mic, please? Hi. I just have a quick question. Um, with regards to the show, I heard Jennifer mention about the scent. I believe that's the judges being able to actually smell the scent of honey. Am I correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So is there a certain type of honey that you would need to use um, in terms of aging? Um, would it have to be fresh or can it be honey that you would have made, say, like a year prior to the show? So the timing of um, how, how long ago you extracted the honey isn't as important as maybe what the honey is going to offer or showcase in scent and flavor when you're baking with it. And sometimes you have to experiment a little bit in order to get that answer. If you've ever baked with um, molasses or sorghum or um, any other syrup that um, has a different flavor and you're not, haven't tried honey much, you might try, like I suggested a little bit of honey blending. You might try working with some honeys that are distinct and unique, both in sweetness and imparting a unique flavor or aroma, and also some of the honeys that are a little bit more robust and dark, um, but maybe not a whole, like the whole honey component being the darker, robust honey. Okay. So like a blend of two or three honeys. Uh, say I had a really dark um, avocado or buckwheat honey, and I needed a cup of honey. I might use like a third or a quarter of the buckwheat and I would use a real sweet honey, like my orange blossom for another portion. And then I had the honey, like Richard was talking about, that has this unique characteristic that's distinct and, and pretty pronounced and it's floral or um, spicy or a combination. I might add that to the, the third component, you know, third portion of the honey and, and practice a cake with it. And when it's done cooling, and you want to smell the cake, you literally can just lift the cake up to your nose and give it a good smell. And, and my hope is that you can smell that honey right then and there. That's the goal. Um, the, the judge is going to cut the cake in half as well and smell it. Um, but you want to have that distinct ab ability to smell some honey in the cake for sure. Okay, great. Does that help? Yes, it does. Awesome. Right. Great question, Karen. Great question. Hope, yeah. to, hope to taste some of that cake in the next competition. I'm looking forward <laughs> to that cake by Karen Cumberbatch. I'm definitely going to take a slice. So right. 300, or lose, I'm taking a slice. We have over 380 people, right, Richard? Yeah, that's what the hope was. And although I didn't see, we got up to 117 today. We had 388 people registered, but we only got up to 117 this morning. So we have nice. 100. 17 cakes due in December. Is that right? Well, that's a lot of, well, I better lose a lot of weight then. <laughs> As I'll get punished afterwards for it. Okay. Thanks for the question, Karen. Um, we have, oh, I saw there was a couple of other people with the hand up. All right. I guess they, oh, we've got um, Siobhan. Let's get Siobhan's got an interesting question. Um, Siobhan, oops, yeah, if you can unmute your mic and ask your question. Hi, Siobhan. Hi, good day, everyone. Um, I just wanted to find out if there's any caution we need to take with regards to baking and honey um, for fear of overheating and losing its nutritional value. I, I feel like I heard part of it. I apologize. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I just wanted to find out if there's any extra precaution that we need to take when cooking with the honey for fear of overheating um, to lose its nutritional value. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you so much. So the standard recipe for the cake um, usually the temperature for baking this particular type of cake is around 325 degrees Fahrenheit. And the way that the recipe is designed is um, to cook it to just done. And you can probably even turn the oven off and leave the cake in the oven. This is a, a 
a special tip I'm sharing with all of you, right? Um, so it, like about five or 10 minutes before the cake is really um, all the way done and you insert like a toothpick or something to get, to make sure that the liquid is um, congealed and the cake is completely done. You might even consider turning the oven off about five minutes before the end of the bake time. And this also will help retain some of the aroma and flavor of the honey. Um, but usually without overheating it and the way this recipe is designed and how much honey is incorporated, um, there isn't too much of an, a risk or issue of overheating or um, doing anything that would hurt the honey. Okay, thank you so much. My pleasure, thanks, Siobhan. Great question, great question, my pleasure. All right, um, do I see anybody up? Karen, you, you want to ask another question or you got you forgot to take down your hand? Which one? You have another question, Karen? All right, we can always try. Um, no, I forgot to take down my hand. Sorry. All right, cool. No problems. All right. Okay, so if that's all the cake questions, which were great, I love the sense. Sounds, sounds like I'm going to have some interesting cake to taste, possibly. Excellent. If I'm lucky. <laughs> um, let's move on to our last slide or, or penultimate slide, I think. Excellent. Art and photography. I'm really excited that you would consider having art and photography in your honey show. It's one of the classes, two of the classes that um, I particularly enjoy. And I feel like it takes quite a bit of time to develop the skill to be a good judge for these classes. And I think sometimes they're even overlooked as far as um, how difficult it is to produce art and photography that would merit an award in a honey show. Again, there's honey shows that happen all over the world and have been happening for hundreds of years. And then there are some wonderful local and regional shows that also host some amazing art and photography. So, um, it's wonderful to take time to be with your bees and the experience that you have when you're with them is something that's difficult to share. Art yes. and photography are one way that we get a chance to give people a glimpse of the magic that we experience as beekeepers and what we see in nature. Yes, yes, yes. But in a, hun yeah. but in a honey show, the judges are um, usually inundated with some uh, images that I'm going to be polite when I say this, but I'm just going to say it, um, you know, a bee on a flower, you know, this is something that, you know, I'm very, I want to be polite. I'm going to encourage you to think a little bit outside the box. Like the, the picture I shared with you here is a little bit a, a different image, something that maybe is a little bit more gives the person a little sense of even their adrenaline might peak a little because they see the swarm and the beekeeper shaking the branch and um, you know it's not the same a bee on a flower is magical it's beautiful to behold it is something that we are all lucky to witness in any any person anywhere on the planet um, but it's it's somewhat overdone in art and photography for a honey show so my first encouragement would be to think carefully and maybe come up with something a little bit more unique um, to give the judge something to be excited about. And that will also set you apart from some of the other entrants if they hadn't heard that tip before. Um, so that's my first thought. My second thought is to make sure to take good time and care like we do with all the other entries to prepare your entry. So read the rules carefully because the entry could be simply, if it's a photograph, it could be simply required that it's mounted on a piece of stiff cardboard or, you know, to make things easy, um, the honey show committee or organization that's hosting the show may want their entrance to feel like this is a very achievable class um, yeah. and that it isn't gonna be an expensive or difficult task. So they may simply say that you could print the photograph and mount it on a piece of cardboard, um, that it's freestanding. So you'll have to put a little time and care into making sure it can stand up with something, holding it up. Um, and then there's usually an index card or a piece of paper accompanying it that won't include your name because, again, we don't want the judge to know who you are. We don't want you in the photograph because we don't want the judge to know it's you. And we want to be able to give everybody the fair, the same fair judgment of each um, entry. So there may be some sort of standard as far as like size, um, again, the mounting. But do take care that the image is um, 
you know, the paper is in good condition, if it's photo paper, um, and that you, you bring it to the show in some sort of sleeve or encased in something so it doesn't accidentally get scratched yes. or have your morning coffee on it, um, which I've done many times with important things. Um, again, just trying to share some, you know, tips that I find really helpful. Um, and then find a, a, a subject that is as interesting as possible. And then the clarity and focal point of your photo for focus should be one that draws your eye right to the area of the photograph that you want um, to be the featured area. So in this case, you immediately look towards the, the middle right where the beekeeper has their arms raised and the bees are, and then you see the bees behind them. Um, but yet on the left side, the grasses and the tree and the sky don't really catch your attention so much. So it's part of the photograph, but it's not really what I'm looking at. Um, so think, think a little bit about your subject, the uniqueness, um, the rule, pay attention to the rules and regulations so you get that photograph um, correct. Because I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've attended a show where we missed something in the rules and the photo didn't make it in the show because we forgot to make it freestanding or we were outside like breaking a stick in the parking lot, trying to use some tape to make the photo stand up. So, um, you know, anything you have to do to, to get it right before you bring it. But the yeah. photography part is really fun. Art is a lot like the open class of baking. Yes. Again, the rules and regulations will, you know, specify what uh, mediums you can use. Usually it can be anything from textile to painting to, uh, 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 sculpture, uh, ceramics or pottery. Um, and it could be something that you're creative with, and it may even be food. You may end up, um, making something with uh, a baked good or, um, a health and beauty product or even uh, a display. And in some cases, um, some of the shows are starting to accept video, um, as part of their, uh, art and photography, um, essays where you would have like several photos that tell a story along with um, some information. So there's, there is so much direction you can go with art and photography in a honey show um, that makes it more than just a bee on a flower, you know? Um, so I encourage everybody that it feels creative. And even if you don't, I think you should give, try your hand at it a little bit, especially if you like to bake or you like to make candles, or maybe you'd like to make a display with several items that you've created together that you feel like um, would catch the judge's attention or even a gadget or something that you use in your beekeeping operation. Um, there is a separate class sometimes just for gadgets, but maybe in this case, this show um, organizer would accept a gadget as a, a form of art. Um, so that's a suggestion. Um, and that's a lot of what I would like to share with you about art and photography. And then from here, I would like to ask Richard and everybody in the group if they wanted to spend some time. First, if you have any questions about art or photography. And second, if you wanted to spend some time answering questions for the rest of our time together about anything we discussed today. Great. So um, I don't have any questions on, on that particular field. Um, I do have, I can say though, I can add, um, we do have one of our presenters for tomorrow with us, Gladstone Solomon, who has competed in the London Honey Show and has Great. won and has won a number of different certificates and along with this contingent from Trinidad and Tobago. And hopefully tomorrow we will have um, Dr. Jessamy, possibly, she has a very busy schedule who has actually won the Henda Cup, the International Cup, International Cup category for honey, at the London Honey Show. So we have representatives from two different countries that have either directly won the Henda Cup or have been associated with the winning of the Henda Cup. Oh, this is really wonderful. So in fact, Gladstone, well, I will not, I will not steal Gladstone's thunder. I, I shall leave that for tomorrow. <laughs> but he, his presentation he's got from... 1987 or 89 to 2000, some point in 2000 of Trinidad competing in the London Honey Show. So he's going to do a whole presentation of the trials and tribulations, the ups and downs, the, the, the it's impossibly strange characters he's met away along the way in his journey. 
and Trinidad and Tobago's journey in the, in the London honey, honey competition. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, one hour, lots of Trinidadian humor and jokes and um, so forth. So I think, um, uh, you know, so I think that's going to be a great presentation for, um, for tomorrow. That's fantastic, Richard. Yeah, so that I don't know if is, is Gladstone there. Gladstone, you there? You want to say a couple of words? You want to plug? You want to plug your um? I'm giving you an opportunity to plug your your event, my brother. Ah, there he is, brother Gladstone. Unmute your mic, sir. Hey, Richard. Hey, Jennifer. Hi, team. Yeah, man. You know today is, is, is such a great day. Excellent presentation. You know, a nice a nice prep. So I'll, I'll just read from, you know, um, the, the other side, you know, I've served a little bit as a, as a judge steward and um, I could, you know, Jennifer, you, as I said, you, you're just on point with, with everything. And I would say, you know, this is a national honey show. So they, there's no sympathy there. You know, if it's not up to mark, it's just not up to mark. Right. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting perspective, a nice, a nice balance. So I'm looking forward to tomorrow's presentation as well. Great. All right. Wonderful. Great, Thank great, you. Great, 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 great. I'm going to get to them and tune in. <laughs> yes. I, I, a lot of your, I, I, I've got a couple of emails from people asking for your contact information, Gladstone. So I'm going to shoot. I'm going to no shoot. Problem. No problem. Shoot you know, your yeah. contact number and your, and your telephone number to few of your compatriots. Yeah, um, we are we are servants of Caribbean beekeeping. So yes, man, yes, man, yes, man. To run it out, and you know, for all of you out there, um, we we so glad for your support. I understand we have some fantastic numbers. So tune in tomorrow, man. I, I, I'm I'm gonna try to keep up with Jennifer. You know, I'm gonna. Try. <laughs> <laughs> no man, it's it's. I'm sure tomorrow is gonna be equally as interesting <laughs> and intriguing, and I knowledge sharing and so far i just hope dr jessamy um can make it tomorrow she 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 didn't promise me she i asked her for an hour she said richard i'm too busy man i said well doc at least try and make a small cameo if it's 10 or 15 minutes you know just give us 10 or 15 minutes and hopefully we can Grandma's gonna yeah. come to doc, dr jessamy is gonna be there i, I put my head on Jesse, man, I'm putting my head on a block for you now. Well, <laughs> boy, you better get you better get her on the phone after this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. I didn't want to tell you that. <laughs> All right. So um, it's been a great session. Um, I'm just oh, I'm looking at okay. Is there anybody anybody got any questions? I don't see any questions. I don't see any questions in the question room. I don't see any questions in the question room. I don't know. So Richard, my oh, yes, we've got one. Okay, we've got one. We've got one. Um, yeah, Galaxy J6. Um, please unmute your mic and go ahead with your question, please. Yeah, um, I just want to say that, that today's um, session was very educational. Uh, uh, something like this, uh, something like this uh, should be done, like say, on a, a more regular basis, so that the Caribbean people as a whole. Could really get involved in the became aspects uh, in terms of business and that kind of stuff. And by the way, this is David Small Barbados. Yeah, hey David, my brother, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. That's good. That's good to hear your voice. Good to hear your voice, and I'm really happy that you could make it and give us give give the event and the occasion your support. Yeah, man. Um, thank you. Thank you, my Thanks brother. So thank much. You. Um, yeah. I have a question there from somebody I want to know what time is Gladstone see Gladstone people are already asking what time is your presentation tomorrow <laughs> you're, you're almost yeah I mean if you're not famous by now you're definitely gonna be famous by tomorrow morning um let's see what time I think Gladstone is on for 11 o'clock 11 o'clock I think is Gladstone's kickoff time if I remember correctly, I'm just opening up my my um, schedule, and I'll be able to give you. Yeah, a... Richard, I think it's eleven. It's eleven, my brother. Yeah. Yeah, because yes, okay, that's good. So it's eleven. Gladstone's on at eleven o'clock. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
All right. So anybody have any questions? Anybody, anybody have any more questions? No more questions. No more questions. We've answered I, all questions. If I may, just some closing remarks, Richard. Yes, definitely. So the, tomorrow is sounding so fantastic. I don't care how busy I am. I feel like I need to tune in. Um, okay. I mean, I'm going to do everything I can to join, but I just want to tell you that I think it's so amazing that we have such, such contribution to this cause because this is really important. Um, and I hope if anything today, you not only got some information that may help you with entering honey shows, but that I have the opportunity to meet with you and visit with you and even be part of your honey show. Yes, um, yes, yes, at, of course. Yeah, at the very least, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be of service and uh, communicate, um, tell some stories, share some laughs, taste some honey and mead and eat some cake together. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Don't don't be discouraged if you feel like some of the rules and stuff we shared today seemed a little strict. Um, please just try it out and give it a shot. It's it's a lot of work, and I know it's precious, valuable time and materials that we are not all fortunate to have an abundance of, especially with the way things are right now. But it is a common um, interest of us all that we share together that uh, unites us and gives us something exciting to do together. And we're, uh, we all enjoy being winners, but it's just as exciting for me to stand aside and help somebody else win. So yes. uh, that's part of it too, for me, is once you learn some of the skill and you do a good job um, and you win some awards, take a break and let other people take a time to yes. an opportunity to, to test their skills and, and win some awards. There's harder shows for you to enter other places. Um, I have a long way to go myself. I haven't uh, won anything at the National Honey Show, so I have a lot of work ahead if I'm going to have that that's to true. compete that's with the nice gentleman that's going to be speaking to you tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not despaired. You give me encouragement, too, um, just by being interested in the, the competition and the categories and taking good care of yourself and your bees and nature. Um, so I have to thank you for what you do and Richard and the organization. Uh, I give you so much credit and I, I appreciate you. So thank you for having me today. Pleasure is mine. Um, Mr. I'm gonna try and get Mr. Romulus if he can give us some closing remarks and then I shall I shall say a few words if I, as your humble servant. Mr. Romulus, would you like to say a few words, sir? Are you around, sir? Mr. Romulus. Oh, he's not there. He's there. Mr. Romulus, Giles? Yes, no, no. He must be on a call. He's probably on a conference call somewhere. All right, he, he will get back to us. Um, just on my part, I would just like to thank everybody that signed in today. We At one point, we had over 117 of you guys, so I really think that's thank you for that blessing. Um, we do have a, a exit survey. Um, just we're trying to compile some information for Jeff um, so that Jeff can continue can continue to invest in these little projects and these little these little events provide us with the the bandwidth provide us with the tools such as paying for the zoom so that we can have these webinars and and get the message of beekeeping and apiculture and the mystery of bees you know to to out there and just to learn and to share the experience um, so I think it's very essential that we do that. So I appreciate if everybody that participates can um, do the exit survey for us. It's just 10 simple questions. It's not going to take too much of your life. It was about 50 questions before I cut it down a little bit. <laughs> but it's now just 10 questions. Um, and if you could participate in that, I really want to thank um, Jennifer for taking her time out of a busy, busy, busy schedule because New York snowed in, so everybody's coming down to Florida to try and escape to as to escape the snow and get some get some sanity, you know. So true. So true. So, so I'm sure I'm sure that the, the the coffee shop's buzzing. Well, it, sh it should be getting ready to buzz for the lunchtime buzz soon. So I mean I'm it's sure buzzing. I 
Hope you can all visit sometime. Yes. So I really appreciate you taking time out um, to share your knowledge and experience and your love of the apiculture, your love of bees, and your love of what we can do together as a team. And I think one of the greatest caveats that we should all take from this is that just as the colony of bees work together as a team, we as beekeepers have to work together as a team, despite being separated by water. Um, we need to use the technology um, and you know communicate and reach out to one another if you need support or knowledge or just to try a new idea. We have this forum available for us and let's utilize it and you know let's work together like bees and give us the support that we need together to elevate the industry in the Caribbean and that the Caribbean and the Americas as a whole, because we are all one continent really from South America right through the Caribbean basin up to North America, it's the Americas. We can work as a single unit and you know make sure that bees have a safe place within our hemisphere in, in the world. All right, so that's my note, that's my final words. Um, Brother Solomon, I don't know if you wanna say a few things about tomorrow or, you, or, your, or your goods. You have to unmute. You have to unmute. Unmute your mic. You have to Amen. unmute. Sorry, I got, I got okay. you. I got you. All right, sir. Um, no, listen. Based on what I see, I'm just going to... I have to top up my game, you know? And I'm, I'm working on that for the rest of the day. So there's, there's going to be some interesting anecdotal bits of information that, you know, went into making the package together. And that would surround and support... Um, Jennifer's very meaningful and, and excellent presentation. You know, um, I'm, I'm so glad, Rich, that, you know, we in the region here are moving in this direction. We've had individual honey shows, but um, down the road, uh, maybe next year, and um, anticipating St. Lucia being a sort of headquarters for a, a Caribbean honey show plus other elements, I think this is an excellent. Um, sort of prep uh, presentation that we're doing, yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we still definitely. produce some of the best honeys in the world, and I'll give you some, I'll share some records with you tomorrow to confirm that. And I got a surprise for you, Richard. Are you <laughs> I have a surprise for me? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I better show up <laughs> for sure. You better. <laughs> I, 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 I better show up, man. I better show up. But I just want to thank everybody once again. And mm -hmm. remember to do the exit survey, please. Remember to do the exit survey. I remember we got a packed, really, really interesting day tomorrow. We've got Carla, we've got Gladstone, and we possibly, um, if as a, we have Dr. Jessamy on board tomorrow, because Gladstone put his head on a block. So Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And I need my neck. I, I would definitely be saying off with his head if she doesn't turn up. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the way from all the way from Silicon, be saying off with his head, man. Be off. So, I'll do the same for you, Rich. Uh, sorry, man. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. But yeah. definitely, once again, everybody who participated today, I really want to thank you for your presence. Um, and take the exit survey. Um, you know, we've done all we can. Let's try and bring this together. Caribbean unity. Um, let's, well, let's stick, let's not even call it Caribbean. Let's call it B unity, man. This is the, we are the B in the Caribbean, man. So let's bring everybody together and let's work as a team and let's keep this momentum. Many thanks, everybody. Um, you know, Jennifer, once again, you're my hero. Thank you very uh, much. All right. right thank you. Everybody take care. And bye. Take bye. care. Right. Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash the People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures, Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability. Tune in to the live opening. Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th. That's not all. Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th. Come learn from a leading international expert everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show. Registration is open now. The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN, and other corporate partners.
Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash. The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures, Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability. Tune in to the live opening. Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th. That's not all. Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th. Come learn from a leading international expert everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show. Registration is open now. The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference is brought to you by GEF, SGP, UNDP, UE, CYEN and other corporate partners.